um, I was stuck at, in as a guest, so I apologize for the delay. Uh, thank you to our city clerk for catching that and uh, transferring me over. So this is the beginning of our uh, meeting for Neighborhood Services and Education Committee. Um, I believe Mike is going to be calling a roll or someone else from our city clerk's office. Okay, uh, Jimenez. Cohen. Here. Esparza. Here. Carrasco. Here. Arenas. Here. Thank you. Wonderful. So we meet quorum. And um, next is our review of our work plan. This is the family friendly initiative work plan status report. And um, it is recommended to be dropped and will be added later on to our work plan. Can I get a motion? Motion, motion to drop. Approve. Second. Wonderful. Ruth, I think it's you who is yes. going to. Okay. Uh, Chair, uh, excuse me, Chair, this is Mike, staff support. We do have one public speaker on this. Oh, excuse me. Thank you so much, so much Mike. You're welcome. I appreciate it. All right, go ahead, Ms. Uh, Woodmancy. Oh, and thank you to, to uh, stay. You can hear me? Yeah. Yes, can you hear me? please. Okay, good, sweetie. Thank you. I don't have a, oh, there's a timer. Good, sweetheart. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, and thank you for Mike. Thank you for staff for anybody who actually um, catches public comment because this is public comment is um, very much threatened you know we're an endangered species so thank you uh, for anybody who catches that but getting back to what i was going to say uh, about our agenda the, okay our agenda has to be uh, sped up to really address our climate crisis it's the most in this the world health organization says this is the most threat to all human life on earth and also of course all the other uh, life on earth which actually my husband as a biologist says none else nothing else is going to exist all animals that we know of are all going away so the only thing we can do is cope and humans can cope and that's the beauty of the human species but what we have to start doing is building resiliency into our community and so what i'm saying is that we need to buy the land in my my land in my neighborhood, 615 Stockton Avenue, because it is an open lot. Right now it's an open lot. Ms. Whitman, would you please, um, this this item is regarding the drop of a work plan item. I know, I know the work plan and you're interrupting me because that's what we've all been told. It's good to interrupt Tessa to make sure she stays on task. But the issue is that we have a climate crisis and that is everything that we're dealing with is our climate crisis. So what I'm saying is that we do need to buy land to grow food. We need urban sustainability and the education because that is your that is your mission is neighborhoods and education. This item and what is I'm about saying, dropping something else. Is that correct, Chair? Yes, it is. Uh, okay, Please dropping something. Please. Yeah. So, but it, it's about your work your your work agenda. Your this is agenda. a family friendly initiative work plan status report okay. that's getting dropped. Okay. So I'm 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 talking about that we should not drop a family a status work plan, that we need families to learn to live without fossil fuels, learn to live without waste, and learn to live without plastic. That is what we need. Thank you, Ms. Woodmancy. And so I'm just really gonna warn our speakers, which is, uh, uh, Chair, I believe you are muted. Thank you, Mike. That's why uh, I really appreciate Mike and this meeting. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to just uh, give a heads up to all of our uh, speakers for today that join us um, to please stick to the item. Otherwise, what I'm going to ask our city clerk is that you get cut off. Um, and I apologize about that, but we really need to stick to our plan. We have five items. Um, very lengthy and detailed items. Um, and I believe we have a hard stop for one of our um, committee members as he needs to go to another committee. Um, so we, I remind all of my colleagues and our residents to um, make sure we stay on track so that we can get through all of these really great items. Okay, so moving on to consent calendar. This um, is- Sorry, Chair, I think we have a, a couple more public speakers that- Oh, we do? Okay. Great. Thank you, Mike. 
5140. We don't have a climate crisis. We have a budget crisis. And all these rules and laws that everybody's passing are not working, right? And it's costing a lot of money. You guys want to get rid of parking in downtown San Jose. How crazy is that? How much environmental destruction is there going to be with the fumes from the, from the machinery and the silica and sand and dirt in the air? That you're going to tear down things and redo things? That's going to destroy the environment. All the traffic that it's going to create, just like the traffic is going to create on Hillsdale with Pam Foley's half-baked idea of road diets. How much environmental damage is going to be done with, once again, all the machinery, all the digging, all the dirt in the air, all the traffic that it's going to, that it's going to cause? You're not going to be a green city if you continue to make stupid decisions like this. Every road needs to be repaved popularly needs to be repaved properly before you decide to even think about a road diet. But no, you're going to go right ahead and do it, just like the petulant children that you are in that city council. Sir, you can you relate this back? Excuse me, can you please relate this back to the work plans that we're talking about for the, the Neighborhoods Commission, the Parks Recreation Commission, and the Senior Citizens Commission? Oh, for, is this for parks? This is for all of those commissions. This is a work. This is the work plans for all of those commissions that I just mentioned. Okay. Well, if this is for the parks, like you say it is. Then what you need to do is defund the park police, and and then you can rehire them to work overnight in my area, trying to stop the crime between midnight and six p.m. Versus them chasing people off of picnic tables. Okay. You, that's what you need. That's what work plan you need to do. You need to have more police officers in the Southern Division that are going to be patrolling between midnight and six. And Blair Beacon. Hi, thank you. Blair Beekman here. Thank you for noticing and allowing public comment for uh, the future of uh, work work plans uh, uh, agenda items at this time. I wanted to quickly ask and be sure that I, I wanted to speak on a uh, consent calendar. And uh, if, if you can make sure to have public comment time available for that time, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Beekman. Mike, it seems like that's the last speaker, correct? Yes, Chair. Wonderful. Um, so could I um, please get a motion? Or we have a motion. I think we're voting. Excuse me? We Do have we have a motion already for this consent? We have a motion. We uh, we haven't uh, called. Voted. It. OK, so, sorry. So, Go um, ahead. Jimenez? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Carrasco? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Thank you. Perfect. Um, we're moving on uh, to reports to the committee. Uh, this is Police Athletic League PAL status report uh, from our Parks and Recreation Neighborhood Services. Um, and so once we get to our community uh, speakers after the presentation, we're going to need to keep to that item. Go ahead, um, our Parks and Rec uh, Department staff. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for having us. So my name is Avi Otam, Deputy Director of Parks, Recreation and Neighborhood Services. I'm pinch hitting today for John Cicerelli, our director. And uh, we're here to present our update on the operational partnership between the Police Activities League and PRNS. And uh, our presenters today will be Shannon Heimer, our division manager for parks, destinations, events, and sports, which includes PAL Stadium, Emma Pruch Farm Park, Happy Hollow Park and Zoo, Arcadia Ballpark, and Lake Cunningham Action Sports Park. Joined by Captain Todd Trayer, uh, the police department liaison to the PAL board, as well as Jay Bacalamana, the president of the PAL nonprofit. So with that said, I'll turn it over to Shannon. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here to provide an update on the partnership with PAL. 
PAL has been established to operate, promote, and support the PAL facility so that youth and their families can participate in engaging activities in a fun and safe environment with mentors from law enforcement agencies providing youth opportunities to develop into responsible adults. Sure, my slide moves forward. There we are. Some background. As recommended in the 2018 audit, PRNS and San Jose PD met with PAL to redefine the partnership with PAL. In February 2020, this committee approved a model of joint operation of the facility, and in January 2021, the City Council approved the guiding principles for the new partnership. These principles are, the PAL serves as a program operator and fundraiser, connecting the community through outreach and donor relations. PAL also conducts daily facility and field maintenance. The key focus for these activities is on youth programming and connecting them with law enforcement. PRNS serves as a contract manager, provides staff support with PAL board development. PRNS also provides program development and coordinates with PAL to perform limited daily field maintenance and manage ma major capital projects. PRNS's primary focus is to support PAL as a board develops a sustainable operating and development plan. San Jose PD will focus on providing officers to serve as coaches, mentors, and support staff at PAL programs and events. The primary concentration for officers will be to engage youth individually and as teams to create relationships that develop, uh, develop and support local youth. Additional principles are the development of a strategic plan, recruitment of an executive director, and providing PAL with 50,000 in funding support for board development in the first year of the contract. Agreement highlights. The city and PAL share the goal of cooperatively discussing program priorities, funding strategies, board development, and collaborating on facility use and maintenance. The terms of the contract aim to create a strong public-private partnership that increases PAL board's leadership and ability to operate and promote the PAL facility. Key deliverables of the contract are within six months of contract signing. PAL will have a strategic plan that outlines program and funding goals and strategies and will have updated bylaws to include conflict of interest policies and a code of ethics among other appropriate updates. Milestones include establishing annual monthly meetings, a method of submitting annual monthly reports, and collection of pertinent program, donor, and operational data. This data will determine baseline measurables that demonstrate whether program goals are being met. PAL will provide a monthly key performance indicator report that will help all partners understand if we are achieving the goals set forth in the contract reaching the youth most in need and improving equity and access. The partners will collaborate on a review of the metrics and key performance indicators to assess programs and resources and make adjustments as necessary to most effectively serve our community. This exchange of information and use of collective reporting to set goals and assess metrics is what we established with the Happy Hollow Foundation several years ago and has strengthened the relationship and collaboration for both organizations. The initial contract term is three years with two three-year renewals for a total of nine years. Funding support is provided in the first three years as appropriations allow in order to support board development and build a sustainable organization. PRNS will support board development efforts with one-time funding of 50,000 for fiscal year 2021-2022, as well as with a minimal level of maintenance and programming positions. The contract is currently in final legal review we expect to hear from our respective attorneys next week on last details to address and have final signatures shortly after that is complete. As COVID restrictions lifted, PAL returned to what they do best, providing youth programming and planning. Board President Jay Baca Lamana is here today to share some of PAL's recent programming successes and talk about the direction PAL is headed in partnership with PRNS. So I'll hand it over to Jay at this point. All right, good afternoon to all the council members. Thank you for having us here today. Uh, first, I'd like to state our partnership with the city and PRNS has been wonderful. Shannon Heimer, Troy Tread, and the PRNS department, <clears throat> excuse me, have all been very helpful, team focused, and overall amazing. Communic communication has been on a weekly basis and highly effective. So thank you for that, you guys rock. Um, all right, so let's get into the fun stuff, um, the kids programs. As we all know, all programs had to stop last year because of COVID the, the COVID pandemic. And as of now, here's a summary of our numbers post-COVID. 
San Jose Pal Baseball has four teams. Each team has 12 plus players. Uh, we are estimating an increase in growth by 30% for SJ Pal teams by next season for baseball. This year is the first year we had San Jose Pal Open Division. We had 12 teams and each team had 12 plus players. Again, we're expecting at least a 35% growth in the Open Division by next spring 2022. And again, these are conservative numbers. Uh, fall ball, as it is, it's uh, playing right now. We have 132 participants, and that is an open division. We have 11 teams plus uh, each team has 12 players. Um, in the spring, we had over 201 uh, baseball players, and then the 132 and overall 332 participants for baseball open and open division and our PAL uh, rec team. All right, so this is pretty cool right here. Our first year for flag football, it is in sponsorship with the 49ers. It ended up being the largest free flag football program in the state of California with 175 participants. Uh, I know this is, this is an awesome part. I mean, everything I said up to now is pretty amazing, but when you think about PAL, you think about soccer, baseball, boxing, and football. And when you lose one of those iconic uh, PAL sport teams, it's to me it was kind of heartbreaking. So when we talk about losing our tackle football team four seasons ago to now with the hard work and devotion of, and sheer determination of our football commissioner, Curtis Givens, we have a tackle football team in season as we speak. And that's a big win for us. Um, with football and cheer, we had, you know, 2021, we had 96 participants. Our San Jose football tackle team had three teams, 28 players each. And then our cheer team, again, we lost that four seasons ago. We have 13 participants and we should see that growing by two to three times by next season. And even better news, we have a verbal commitment from four teams that want to join our league. Two uh, inner city teams, Powell Milpitas and Powell Hayward all want to join, join Powell League Tackle Football. And we should see that program grow from 96 participants to 230 kids plus. Unfortunately, our junior giants, we had to close down for the year 2021 due to COVID restrictions, but we will be restarting that, that league next spring. Now our soccer, Metro Pal Youth Soccer, we had over 1,000 participants. And this is post-COVID. Pre-COVID numbers were at our soccer was about 15 to 1,600 plus players. So we should see that type, those type of numbers by 2022. Our boxing uh, this year was between 70 and 100 participants. Taekwondo is around six, uh, 45 to 65 participants. So again, now we have to remember these are anticipated sport and team numbers. And if COVID restrictions stay about the same, we should see a conservative 30 to 35% growth for baseball, the open division and our rec division. In the case of football, cheer, soccer, and the return of junior giants, we should see any growth between 60% to three or four times the current number uh, with, of course, cheer and football. So we should see, uh, so our ultimate goal is to get and be able to support and provide a safe and awesome environment for over 3,000 kids in our community by the end of next year. And as a, uh, has it been my, it's been my focus to not only provide sports, but also activities and expand our programs to our communities. Some of the programs that I'm looking into is chess club, robotics, graphic design, dance, and after school tutoring. Our Believe to Achieve program has been an amazing program that provides mentorship and academic development, family engagement, profession development, and summer learning classes. Now let's get into some of Powell's strategical planning. Our business plan is already in development and focuses on fundraising, donations, sponsorships, grant opportunities, and also includes an updated branding and online presence. An effort to outreach more effectively, Powell is developing a communications plan that updates our website, social media, and other key methods for outreaching to the community, to the city, and the council members themselves. Several grant opportunities have already been pursued. Sponsorships will begin again now that the, that the contract clearly outlines the guidelines for conducting the sponsorships. 
and donations and a marketing strategy is being finalized and will be initiated in the next few months. Board recruitment has been underway. And although we have a strong board of seven members, we'd like to grow that between 11 to 13 members with a focus on additional diversity and back diversity in backgrounds and reflect the community we are serving. An integral part of what we do is connecting youth with the law enforcement. We are looking forward to working more with Captain Trayer on his plans for growing officer participation. And before I pass it on to Captain Trayer, uh, to say more about SJPD's part of the partnership, are there any questions for me? I know that was a lot. <laughs> we will take questions at the end. Um, go ahead, Captain Trayer. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for having me, Council. Thanks for having me. Um, Jay Baca, I can't thank you enough for what you and your team, and now I guess I'm part of your team, are doing for the community. Those numbers are amazing, and I know we're going to grow those numbers in San Jose. And I can promise you that you are saving kids. That's just what it comes down to in my mind. And that is more than I could ever ask for. I'm excited to be on your panel with Powell. I continue to wrap my mind around the history of Powell and where things are going. And I feel there is a very positive momentum right now between PRNS, Powell, and SJPD. Um, everybody here wants what's best for kids. And I know uh, all the council members. Um, want the same. So this infrastructure has been in place for a long time, but moving forward, we have a different administrative focus. And I know that the youth in PAL will continue to thrive. I'm out there watching them hit and run and tackle. And um, I haven't gone to boxing yet. I'm a little afraid to walk into that room. But um, I'm impressed with everything that's been available to these kids so far and what's going to happen in the future. Through all of this reimagining of PAL, there continues to be the restructuring of what the what the p in pal is going to look like right what what are the what are the uh, police going to be how are they going to be involved now that there's been a transition in where we are today i'm going to talk a little bit about that but our goal is to introduce officers as assistant coaches um, they used to be kind of like commissioners of each sport but have them uh, as assistant coaches for all of the sports not not all of those teams that jay talked about but specifically uh, start with the pal teams and then have them there to mentor and to help with uh, coaching the different the different sports in in pal and uh, the assistant coach is kind of a great way to do it i can tell you from my experience i've been an assistant coach for baseball um, and uh, a couple other sports but baseball was a big one with my kids and um, as a regular i'd love to be the regular coach but inevitably um, you know like the president comes to town or something happens where I have to go work uh, back back when I was doing that, especially in the officer's availability changes. So assistant coaching is good because we still have some uh, adult supervision, if you will. We don't have a tremendous amount of volunteers right now for PAL because of the COVID and, and the, the changes that have happened because of the pandemic, but it's really given us an opportunity to meet each other since I'm new um, and come up with a plan to move forward with PAL and police. Um, volunteering police officers uh, for these, uh, these type of assistant coaching will be tricky. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. It's not that the cops don't want to be there, but the um, we're currently having problems even filling overtime positions on the department just due to the number of police and the um, their livelihoods and things that are happening in, their, in, in the world of policing right now. And we still need the boots on the ground. So I can't, uh, I can't take police out of the beat structure right now. The, the department isn't doing that. But that doesn't mean if there is availability for officers to be at something like there is a staffing availability for them, the uh, mentoring officers to be somewhere that we won't shoot that through the chain of command to get that reviewed for approval. We love this PAL program. Um, some of our officers have gone through PAL since they were little. And um, I love hearing that story. And um, it's funny now that I'm kind of being associated more with PAL. Um, to hear the officers on the department say, hey, I used to box when I was a kid or I used to play football when I was a kid or baseball. And now they're truly giving service back to our community and can think of a better result here. So hopefully, uh, Jay, you can get all these kids to sign up for uh, the police department when they're when they're done with the program. Uh, like I said, the biggest challenge is going to be having um, officers uh, finding officers who have the time to sign up for even if it becomes an overtime spot in the future, which is what we're, we're working toward right now. Um, when we go through, look at the 2022 um, budget for PAL, 
and coming up with a real ask for what it would cost to have office an officer out there for soccer, an officer out there for football, officer out there for baseball. Um, I can tell you inherently when I've done coaching like that, that my friends, uh, officers, and even non-officers show up to help, um, which is what I'm hoping will happen. I think um, we, we tend to work in pairs at least. Uh, some of the options we have are like two officers being assigned to baseball because maybe one is not able to full fulfill the hours it takes. Um, Jay and I spoke about the time it does take for uh, the the regular times it would be for something like baseball or football. It can be it can be up to 22 hours a week during those 10 or 12 or 16 week cycles, um, and so we have to figure out a way to do that that would um, allow officers to be there, but also not uh, fatigue the officers with their current work weeks, which we all know is often well more than 40 hours a week. And football, uh, football is about 12 hours a week plus the games on the weekend. So we're developing a plan by uh, recognizing what teams we want officers to be at from the, from the police department. And um, between now and then, when we get all of that wrapped up and, and dialed in, I hope um, you'll see officers out at the tournaments, at the games, and whatever giveaways we have, I want officers to be available and participating. Now, I feel like, uh, knock on wood, that the pandemic is, is slowly coming to an end. And we wanna be a mentorship for those, for those kids, even, um, even when they're not on the field, someone that they can trust and build legitimacy with our department. Uh, in closing, I think uh, we, I hope we agree that the officers bring experience and compassion and definitely a love of mentorship to youth in San Jose. I can tell you, I have great officers just in Foothill Division. Sorry, everybody else. I, I love you all too, but my I have Division One soccer players in uh, who have gone out with me to different events, and I can't believe uh, what they can do in their uniform. But even uh, in if they're in the right gear, what they could do mentoring and teaching kids things like soccer. So I look forward to that connection between us and PRNS and um, the PAL board. And moving forward, um, there's no losing strategy in what we're doing right now. It's just a matter of um, prioritizing and figuring out a way to get officers to connect with the teams. Uh, thank you for your time. And I will, I'm available for questions as well. Thank you, Captain. Um, we're going to move into our community that is waiting to speak. Go ahead, Mike. Thank you for waiting, Tessa Woodmancy. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. I don't understand why uh, the um, legislators don't have access to our public comment. This is a problem with our Zoom. It shouldn't be that way. And in addition, Sylvia, please do not give power to, um, to cut us off like Tony Tabor, like some fascist to cut us off. Because we need to be, you need to at least, uh, Sylvia, say, put us back on, on track, whatever your topic is. That is decent, you know, public uh, uh, engagement. And, and, and Ms. Woodmancy, I've asked you something. to please stick to the I know, topic, I was just, and that is not okay. the topic. Okay, but I wanted to correct that. I took my time to correct the procedure. I've also issues. corrected you earlier, okay. Ms. Woodmancy. Okay, good. Thank, thank you very much. Continue so, with your public comment. Oh, okay, thank you. I appreciate it. This is a very important public comment I'm trying to make, which is about the police. And I don't think that this money that is going to the PAL and this whole um, operation, there's a lot of incestuousness. First of all, even having our police that we pay income as taxpayers to be able to volunteer for these programs. So it's an incest, they're getting a lot of money from our uh, PRNS. And then, you know, to say that it all goes to PAL. And the thing is, uh, we have to really reevaluate that because First of all, our sports are very violent. There's a lot of violence in our sports. And then to have the police with their guns coming to these things, this is not sending the right message, you know, because that is the problem we're having is in violence. And we really need to take our swords and turn them into plowshares. And that needs to be our program going forward in terms of sustainability. That is the only sustainability is that we have to protect nature. And we need to get a program that doesn't have police with guns and, and, and pal that is connected with the police that's all about sports. It needs to be about saving ourselves in terms of our you know, climate crisis and that we need to save nature as well. And we need to become stewards of nature and turn our swords into plowshares. And that does not come from a police that's carrying a gun. So I have a, a, a fence. Okay. 
Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Thank you uh, for this item. Um, a good luck to uh, these are efforts to try to bring uh, you know young persons uh, to good community practices and ideas. And uh, good luck in, in what these efforts can be um, at this time. Um, I guess a reminder, a simple reminder that you know the future. Uh, I, the way I'm learning to understand it, the future of policing is not um, to to end the police at this time, but it is through you know our better community practices that we can develop ways to minimize, you know, limit, and eventually bring down the numbers and uses of police in our future because we'll be developing good community programs. And, you know, PAL is a good community program. Um, I, good luck in, 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 in our ways how we can all work on this issue. I mean, this will take years to work on this. Um, good luck how we can do this together. Um, I had a question about community that uh, on the uh, initial work plan item, I asked at public comment time if I can have public comment at consent calendar to speak. Uh, and you guys simply voted it through uh, as all one item. You didn't take the item separately. I had important words to speak about at the consent calendar. Can I have my remaining time to speak on that uh, consent calendar item, please? Karen. You're mute. Sorry, Karen. That's fine, Sylvia. If he wants to have a few a few moments to speak to that item, that would be fine. Perfect. Mike, if you can just let him go um, on for a couple of seconds more. I, he's lost uh, the rest of his time yes, uh, with us. Yes, 30, 30 seconds, maybe? Yes, of course. Thank you, Mr. Beacon. Thank you. Very nice of you. Thank you. Um, with 30 seconds, uh, I just wanted to offer uh, the consent. Uh, the consent calendar is about the future of, uh, of, of several board and commissions, their yearly work reports and work plans. Um, good luck to the economic, uh, or not the economic roundtable, but there's going to be an equity roundtable beginning in January that I think can very much address the problems we're having with the commission process at this time and how to bring in a better representation from the disability community, the homeless community, and uh, technology and surveillance oversight. Uh, good luck in these efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to my colleagues and uh, Council Member Sparza. Uh, Chair, with respect, we have one more public speaker. Oh, excuse me. Thank you, Mike. Uh, phone number ending in 5140. 5140, I think you're still muted. Five one four zero. Did you want to speak on this topic? Okay, chair, go ahead. Oh, wait, hang on. Yeah. Just Thank you, that. Mike. Hello, hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, go ahead. Okay, fine. You know, you you guys tried real hard not to have me talk, didn't you? Didn't you? That's what you guys do. You it's exactly what Tessa said. You guys want to squelch everybody who criticizes you. You guys chose this job. You're going to get the criticism from me every single time. No, no problem. But could you keep the criticism to PAL status report, please? Okay, yeah, um, PAL status. Needs we're a lot okay of with that. You know why? PAL status needs a lot of criticism. We don't need policemen throwing baseballs around, kicking soccer balls with their whistle around their neck and their PAL gear. It, all this money. Tons of money going to their salaries and to all this sports equipment. You know what we need? We need police officers from midnight to 6 a.m. in the Southern District where they have like one or two officers patrolling around. They can't have, you know, they, they, the San Jose Police Department and my city council members have told me there's not enough money for these people at between midnight and 6. There's plenty of money for PAL, though. There's always plenty of money for that. There's always plenty of money for what else? Traffic enforcement. You need to get your priorities straight. 
It's not it's not fair to the taxpayer that we have to pay for the, these guys to run around kicking a soccer ball. So we we have ball to stick to the PAL We don't need it. Before. We don't need it. We don't need to spend money for PAL. It's a joke. It's a total joke. It's been a joke since I was a kid, okay? PAL is a joke, and everybody knows it. It's for police officers who are lazy that don't want to do anything and pretend that they're, that, that they're some, like, you know, super coach, right? You know, these are the guys who didn't, didn't quite do so well in high school sports and now all of a sudden think that they're going to make some superstar to some kid. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's disgusting. It's disgusting what the priorities of this city, and you guys know it. But you know that you have to give money to this to look like the nice people. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to my colleagues, uh, Council Member Sparza. Thank you. Um, and I am very happy to invest city money into PAL. I'm very happy to support this program. Um, and I can't think of what a better investment for this city to invest in our kids and our communities. So, um, so first, I'd like to um, really thank uh, Shannon uh, for all her work on this. Um, and I'd like to call out Jay and the PAL board for um, frankly welcoming change and working together with the city in new and different ways um, and taking on responsibilities. Um, and so I had um, a few questions. I'll try and keep it short, um, but I, I want to know, uh, so we had the junior giants out at the Bully, Tully ball fields this spring, which was great um, and loved it, um, or this summer, not spring, summer. Um, and uh, so one of my questions was, you know, hearing opening up leagues to Cupertino and other places, how are we going to prioritize local kids um, and, and and I'll be honest, in particular, East Side kids for whom this stadium and this land was donated. So not only was the stadium built for them, but the land was donated for the kids. And that's something I'd like to hear a little bit more about. And I'm not sure who can answer that, but I'll be imagining um, assistant coaches from the PD at the dance club and robotics while, while that question gets answered. Yeah, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, I don't mind answering that uh, if everybody's okay with that. Um, that's a really good question. Maya, that was one of my biggest concerns when you bring in like an open division baseball mm -hmm. team. Um, so one of the most important things for me when we took upon this open division was also keeping our rec team. And our rec teams are uh, pretty much free. You know, all, they're all volunteers. Nobody's getting paid. It's all, you know, it's all volunteer work. And again, when it comes to being um, financially uh, open to these kids, these rec teams, we find ways to fundraise. It's, it's not, you know, coming from anybody else, but our fundraising, our donations, things of that sort. So it was very important that we made sure that we kept the rec baseball team in there. And when it comes to football and soccer, we have our home teams that actually practice at, at PAL, um, you know, every week. So those teams themselves have, you know, the ability either uh, to have a very low cost. And then we also have sponsorship programs if the kids cannot afford or the parents can't afford, you know, for, you know, the equipment or, you know, registration or insurance of anything of that sort. Um, I do hope that answers your question. I think I would yeah, add, add Jay that we've been trying, we've been wanting to focus as soon as we're almost done with this contract. We wanted to focus more on our outreach and bringing. That's where we really need to start next is more outreach to the community and bringing them in because we have some of the resources available, but we need to reach we need to reach that audience and and, and our neighborhood more. Right? We've talked a bit about that. And one other thing, and, and that's exactly why I wanted to start the activities portion of these these programs. Uh, you know, with the chess or you know, uh, tutoring, uh, robotics, or graphic design, bringing those into the equation uh, gives these kids the opportunity, not even, you know, they're not a focused on a sport, but focused on, you know, other things, right, that, you know, that they love to do, um, that they're good at doing. 
And so that would be at PAL always. And so focusing on that, the inner city kids with those activities, I think is gonna be very beneficial as well. Thanks. One of the things I'd, I'd be interested in hearing more, I, I understand that the, this is all um, uh, a moving target, that it, the work is under development, is um, I'd, I, I'd be interested in seeing if there were some policies um, developed about prioritizing some of this, because I know that the, um, the open teams can sort of lock up a bunch of time. And I agree with you, Jay. I think that that's sort of the trend that PAL is going in terms of having more episodic um, connections with kids, right? Like I, I'm super excited to see the dance club and the robotics. I expect to see Captain Trayer out there. Um, but but uh, so I get I get that. But I, I'd like to see what that looks like more formally because I, um, you know, I, I think it's easy to just lock up those dates. So I, I'd like to see something develop that was a little bit formal that gives um, gives the stadium sort of what it needs to activate those leagues. But at the same time, we're making sure that we have formally prioritized those local kids and I know that's where your heart is because we've had many conversations about that um, and the sponsorships and marketing so um, I was happy to see that move forward I know that that's been an issue for a long time when you said that that's moving ahead in two to three months can you be more specific yes um, great question again when we talk about let's be honest here I want to be frank you know unfortunately we with PAL in the past, and we, we've been here for so many years, uh, one of the, the biggest things that uh, I wanted to change, you know, even as a VP, you know, three years ago, I noticed that we were not up to date and up to speed with our business and our strategical plan. And so our outreach started to get smaller and smaller. And, you know, just doing flyers, um, not being able to reach the, you know, everybody's so much more busier these days. So. You know, mail using the mail isn't always effective either. So the obviously the ultimate goal with our strategical plan is to outsource a real marketing company that's going to develop a plan and a strategy for moving forward, not only with marketing, you know, in house, but also social media. Um, you know, also with our PR. You know, what kind of PR work are, is necessary for us to make sure that we're outreaching the right people. And, and getting the, that good, the good news out to everybody that, hey, we're still here, we're thriving and we're growing. And so that was that's the main focus for me is that marketing strategy. Because I know if we're not able to reach out to people, we're gonna slowly kind of fall back again. And uh, this is very important for, for all of us, so. That's great to hear. And so is that what's gonna happen in two to three months? Is that what's happening? Is that, a, that yes. company is gonna be brought in? Okay. Well, well, the main focus right now, um, you know, of course, I had to put some delay on the actual strategical plan until we got the, you know, the contract to, hey, sure. we're, we're just about to sign this. Now that we are just at that door, it's time for me to really focus on our um, policies and procedures, our bylaws to make sure they are coinciding with our contract with the city. And then once we do that, then we'll start moving forward with the strategical plan implementing the, the the bylaws and the policies and procedures into that. And then we, we start, you know, outsourcing that marketing strategy as well. Okay, Council thank member, you. I wanted to add that we've included in the contract that the same standards we use for a citywide sports program in terms of prioritizing nonprofits and uh, area youth are also included. And so we'll be looking at implementing that as well as outreaching just, and we'll be able to do some of some of the more grassroots outreach efforts with the support of our programming, PRNS programming staff. Okay, that's, that's great. Thank you. And then um, I had a question about um, the strategic plan. Does that still have milestones connected to it? Milestones. Can you give me an example? Uh, this might be a question for Shannon. Yeah. I, I thought the, in the agreement there were going to be milestones. Yes. Within connected the to the within the first six months we'll have a strategic plan that outlines the next three years the plans of how we'll be how what what we'll be fundraising for what our programs will look like and um and that includes the data collection as well as the results we want from that in terms of who's participating in our programs and the things we just talked about 
Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then, uh, so we're we're funding um, a PAL board and organizational development, which I think is an important, very, very important investment in getting what we as a city want to see. Um, is there an extension? And I'll, um, this is my last question, so um, I know we have time constraints, but is, is there a possibility for an extension? Because I think that um, this is so important and I think we're all so invested in this that if there's a need to extend it to get what we need um, collectively, that um, I just wanna make sure that that's an, there's an opening to do that. I think council member what you mean in terms of being able to to provide additional funding I yes guess, is in and in the contract we've allowed for potentially a hundred thousand next year and 150 the third year and okay. so for a total contribution of three hundred thousand over the first three years to get them up developed and running on their own and, and okay. i'll just add on to shannon's comment that at, at present, the contract includes with it $50,000 that the city council has already appropriated through the adopted operating budget. Those second and third year funding streams would be subject to uh, appropriation by the city council. So those, those funds have not yet been identified, but we've created a contract that has the ability to implement that if funding okay. is found. Okay, got it. Um, and last comment is, I think it might be helpful for the discussion. If we get something in writing ahead of time, I know the presentation was attached but there wasn't um, uh, a memo per se. And I don't think we need a motion on this. Is that correct, Chair? No motion needed, we're just accepting the report. Okay. Right, this is just a report, thank you. Well, I'm excited, I can't wait. I'm super excited and grateful. Thank you, bye. Wonderful, Councilmember Carrasco. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of what uh, Council Member Esparza asked, I, I was, uh, I had the same questions regarding priority, regarding outreach. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone that's been involved in this process. It's it's been a, a a long process. I know that there's still a lot of work to be done, but but I really appreciate the work that has been done and how far we are. Uh, of course, uh, you know, Council Member Esparza, Council Member Arenas, and myself. We, we represent that little triangle right outside of uh, Pell. So a lot of our kiddos uh, depend on these extracurricular activities. And I don't like to uh, get into debates or respond to public comment, but I am compelled to say a couple of things. One is, uh, you know, investing in children and making sure that they have uh, other options in their lives when it comes to recreation, when it comes to health, when it comes to safety, is all part of a public safety plan. Uh, you know, we appreciate the work that our, our men and women in uniform do, uh, but public safety is st such a, a, a bigger plan. Uh, so we wanna make sure that kiddos don't look at gangs as part of their membership, but look at maybe a sports team as, uh, as a way of supporting their sense of belonging and building community. So I, I just wanted to, to re-emphasize my commitment to our, our children in the city of San Jose, especially on the east side of San Jose, where we know that especially during COVID, our kids didn't have a front yard. They didn't have a backyard. Uh, we have very few parks that they can walk to. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm working on uh, the urban canopy on the east side because I actually drive to Willow Glen or to those areas that have a greater protection from the elements. And so uh, being able to, to provide the activities, provide committed funding and to provide the facilities such as PAL so that our children can be safe is uh, on, on the top of my list. Uh, and I know that a lot of the council members feel the same way because we see the ramifications and the consequences when you don't have uh, those kind of alternative um, uh, options. And so, uh, and, and the other thing is also when we talk about uh, climate change or, uh, or making uh, changes to the way that we live our lives, I, I just wanna emphasize some, some communities are not in a position as much as we want uh, our communities to be in, in that position to not work and to stay home and to barter for, uh, for, for primary elements that they need for their lives. It's just not possible. 
And so we need to continue working on an infrastructure that provides safety, economic vitality, and now after COVID recovery uh, from the devastation of COVID, Eastside was hit very, very hard. And I'm that's why I'm even more grateful for all the work that each and every one of you is doing. I also wanna mention Angel Rios. Uh, Angel's been uh, on this from the very beginning, making sure that, um, that we just really align all our ducks, uh, you know, set them up in a row and make sure that we, we have a funding, that we have an infrastructure, that we have programming. And now hopefully uh, we'll have a, a real strategic marketing plan so that we can continue doing outreach. I, I encourage you to continue using the council members as at least your very uh, primary or your first go-to uh, when it comes to outreach. You know, uh, 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 you know, to the dismay of some uh, some audience members, the council members work with the school districts. We know our neighborhoods. We know how to reach our families. Use us. Use us because I want to see a very robust program coming out of PAL and be able to offer uh, these kids opportunities that they may not otherwise have. And the other thing that is concerning to me, um, Captain Treyer, was uh, some of the comments you know about about the scarcity or the lack of uh, time uh, on our police officers. Uh, I don't think that just because uh, whatever salary is attached to them you know, they're obligated to do volunteer time, unlike what one of the audience members mentioned. Uh, this has to, you know, be be an opportunity for both the department to connect with our, our youth and for the youth to have a connection with individuals who are going to be in their communities uh, doing important work. And so having a relationship, and I'm just trying to, to, you know, as you were speaking, trying to figure out how to build in that kind of uh, that kind of time so that our officers have an opportunity without neglecting the the other work that is so vital to making sure that uh, you know break-ins are taken care of and car theft is taken care of and side shows are attended to and you know all of the the numerous uh, issues that are starting to mount in in the city that we live in but you know if uh, you know I, I'm happy to take it offline but to do a brainstorming session maybe with some of the other council members here to talk about like how do we build in some of this time so that our officers don't have to choose one or the other but they can uh they can see this as part of their uh overall mission and overall work and we can figure um uh given our time constraints and our staff constraints how do we bridge that relationship i think the p in pal is significant it's important uh, it, it, you know, pal is pal, pal, pal has a P in it and we have to make sure how, how we, uh, really, um, uh, give, give that relationship a, a real platform that can allow it to develop, whether you're coming into pal or it's an extension and satellite into Foxdale or Poco way, or, uh, you know, these other, um, uh, residential areas where we know we need the P uh, to to be part of that relationship. Anyway, Chair, I know that we have a very busy agenda, and uh, and I'm going to just close my comments with another uh, thank you uh, all the way around. Thank you so much. Uh, and on behalf of the kiddos in uh, my district and uh, in the city of San Jose, not just my district, but the entire city of San Jose, I want to thank you again for all the work that you're doing and for your commitment to our kiddos. I second that. Uh, Council Member Carrasco, uh, I'm not gonna repeat some of those points that you've already made, um, but that's exactly what I was thinking. Um, as you were speaking, I was uh, shaking my head. Yes, yes, that's exactly what we need in terms of investment for our youth. And I would not like to have an owl. I would like to continue to have a pal. Um, it makes more sense for us. And these are role models in our community that are going to inspire um, career choices uh, that will uh, serve their own community and they, other uh, future generations will be able to see themselves in those who serve them as police officers. And so um, thank you for those comments. Um, my only comment is going to be around um, the kind of targeting that we're uh, uh, that we're 
exerting right now. And I heard loud and clear that you're thinking about doing a more uh, or hiring a consultant for marketing. Um, but I didn't hear an expansion or a folding in of, of other genders um, or sports that target other genders. Um, and so this, I mean, I, I, I know that there's a lot of folks who um, see themselves as non-binary and uh, don't identify with either gender, but there's a lot of other sports outside of the ones that you named that could target um, some of the um, young girls or however it is that they are identi identify themselves um, for, for some alternative sports. That's a great question. And I love that you actually did that because I did forget a little bit about that um, just due to the fact I knew I had about offense and I'm sure I went over it. Um, but yes, one of the things that I've been looking into is different types of dance, not just like a, a hip hop or anything like that, more, um, more of like, uh, some, some Hawaiian or some, uh, some, some kind of dancing or a salsa dancing aim that's diversifies dancing. And I want it to be, um, kind of where it rotates. It's not just the same kind of dance. We're being able to diversify from that. Um, I didn't mention just because we're still in, we're still in the talks with it, but, um, we're also speak San Jose state and I've always wanted to restart a track and field program as well. Mm -hmm. And so of course, with our capital improvement, one of the things is to redevelop, obviously, if we're going to fix, you know, turf the field, we're going to all fix we have to fix the track so we want to make it to the to the point where we actually do have uh track and field as well program so i think that'll be a real good diverse program that we've never had mm -hmm. uh, for, you know pal itself um well, and listen I, I won't take more time um from this item but i would like to encourage um those folks who continue to be um participating in this process and we'll carry out the ma the master planning um, which will bring in those the community members and that you bring in that youth and bring in some gender neutral um, and gender specific um, sports because they are right uh, flag football unless you say it's a mixed gender flag football is intended for boys um, or those who identify as boys. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that we just need to expand what we, um, who we typically were target and bring in um, uh, uh, just a myriad of things um, and let it be born through that feedback that our community provides us in our uh, master plan process. And so um, I'd love to see uh, some dances, and if that our community wants, uh, I'd love to sign my kid up for dancing at Pal Stadium. Um, otherwise, I'll be signing them up to some traditional uh, sports. Uh, but I hope to see, uh, like I said, some just diverse options. All right, uh, moving on to a motion. I don't think we I have a motion just yet. Do you need a motion? Well, oh, we don't need a motion. Well, I, I should wait. I should wait. Typically, when the recommendation on the agenda says accept the verbal report, we do have a motion. Got it. Okay. Uh, I apologize, Council Barza. We took a motion away from you. <laughs> but uh, whoever well, would like to take it, Councilmember Carrasco, uh, if you want to make the motion, I'll second. Okay. Motion to approve. Second. Wonderful. Mike. Jimenez? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Carrasco? Aye. Arenas? Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. I thought it was going to be Mike. Uh, next, we have a city roadmap food and necessities distribution status report. This is item 2D. And our Parks and Recreation Neighborhood Services uh, Department will be presenting. Uh, for those who will uh, provide comment after, please uh, um, pay attention to our presentation. And that way, your comments can adhere uh, to the content that we're going to be discussing. I really appreciate that because we still have 
five more items, including this one. I'm going to reduce uh, comments to a minute. Um, we just can't afford to spend uh, that much time. Uh, otherwise, we're going to be here until six, and uh, we won't meet core. Okay, go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. My name is CJ. Like Avi before me, I'm going to be pinch hitting for our director, John Cicerelli, to, to introduce the presentation. So let me go ahead and share screen. So good afternoon, committee members, members of the public and city staff. Uh, my name is CJ Ryan. I'm the interim administrative officer for PRNS. And today we're going to be presenting an update on the food necessities program on the city roadmap. With me here, I have Dat Liu, the program manager for the food team in PRNS. Good afternoon. So over the last three months, the food necessities team has transitioned from direct response to the COVID-19 emergency to play a stronger role in the efforts. COVID-19 has caused significant damage to the economy, as you all know, and many families and San Jose residents continue to face food insecurity. As the conditions of the pandemic have changed, we have reassessed our objectives. Our first two objectives remain the same, feed our most vulnerable and maximize existing networks. Our third objective has shifted from scale for a widespread food crisis to build capacity for long-term recovery. Shift is important as food insecurity existed before the pandemic, spiked during the pandemic and has continued at elevated levels. As we do make this shift from response to recovery, we have streamlined our program from over 25 partners to six programs and have focused on highly reimbursable programs and programs of last resort. The agreements that have sunset include the World Central Kitchen's Great Delivered Program and most of our community impact grantees. We're extremely thankful to our partners and are proud to have supported the work that they have done. Slide here shows the amounts of funding that have been allocated during this first quarter of the fiscal year to these six different programs. We're currently budgeted to continue these programs through December 31st of 2021 with a modest reduction of services occurring this quarter. We are working with the budget office on requesting additional American Food Plan funding to continue services past December, and that request will be going to City Council in November. While we are requesting funding to continue programs generally. We're also trying to be strategic about transitioning families and residents off of the program. We want participants to be able to find alternatives as this program will not be available for much longer. So for example, due to the expansion of programs such as universal school meals, we have worked with Off the Grid on a planned ramp down where meals will be scaled back and participants that live outside of the American Rescue Plan's qualified census tracts will be asked if they're still in need of services. The program that has seen the most consistent reduction is in the homeless isolation quarantine program, which is managed by the county, as they have found alternative sites for the, uh, for the individuals that need it. So while the economy has not fully rebounded, uh, we do have optimism about our ability to ramp down over the next six months. Um, the pressures affecting food insecurity are mixed. The consumer price index increased by 3.7% from one year ago. This includes prices on food. I personally shop for a family of four and I can see the difference in my weekly grocery bill and I'm sure you can too. At the same time, more people are back at work, which is great news. As of August, unemployment is at 4.8% in the San Jose metropolitan area, down from last August level of 8.2%. And while this is a huge improvement, it is a far cry from the unemployment rate prior to the pandemic in February of 2020, when San Jose's unemployment rate was at 2.6%. Another factor that adds relief for families is that the universal school meals went into effect, giving all school-aged youth access to free breakfast and lunch. And then finally, with a decentralized food provider network, there are inconsistencies in data measurements and the programs across the county and strategies that uh, combined to reduce the efficiencies that we have. And so we've begun participating with the county to bring that network together. 
It's this mixed nature of the pressures that have informed our ramp down strategy. Uh, we know the future is unpredictable. So while we hope to continue to scale down, we'll be ready to pivot and re-engage uh, in case of any surge in, uh, any surge in the virus or any surge in need. And so now I will hand the presentation over to DAT. Thank you, CJ. Good afternoon, members of the committee, members of the public, and fellow city staff. Um, as CJ mentioned, my name is Detlu, and I am the program manager for the food and necessities team. Thus far, CJ has provided updates on the status of our programs. I would like to highlight some of the equity-focused strategies our team is developing and provide a brief look ahead. At its core, food distribution is about finding those folks in need and providing them the resources uh, to feed themselves and their families. Participant eligibility has always focused on those with high risk of COVID-19, as well as those that have been most economically impacted through layoff or business interruptions. With the passage of the American Recovery Plan and its emphasis on eligibility based on the qualified census tracts, our team has a new tool to identify and serve those most in need. Because the QCTs highlight and designate specific areas, it has allowed us to work with existing partners to enhance program components so that resources are used more efficiently. A key example of this is enrolling waitlisted participants residing in the qualified census tracts into a program, even as the program itself is ramping down. While we are in a resource reduction phase, our goal is to ensure that the resources available are maximized in the most efficient and equitable manner possible. Next slide, please. For the look ahead, I'd like to focus on three major points. Foremost is a continuing ramp down of services through March, 2022. Currently, we have scaled down to six programs that provide over 8 million meals a month. We are working with the budget office to determine the amount of funding available in 2022 and coordinating with all our partners to provide information on alternatives such as CalFresh or WIC for those participants that continue to have a need. We're also working with a, uh, to partner with the Santa Clara County Office of, 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 of Education to provide meals during the winter breaks. We have reached out to SCOE and are currently awaiting their needs assessment results from the school districts. Our team does have set aside funding and we are ready to call upon our partners as necessary when we get the county's uh, directive. Lastly, it's our desire to work alongside the county to build a sustainable food network. The county has initiated meetings with key regional stakeholders and has engaged the University of California's extension to provide support in assessing the current status of the regional food network. Internally, we are working to bring aboard a policy analyst dedicated to maintaining a relationship with the county's work group. Right now, this work group is collecting data to get a clearer picture on what the regional food network entails and how it can be improved. We're also researching other funding sources local, state, and federal that can support an ongoing food safety net. Thank you, and we're open to questions. Thank you. Um, so we were gonna go to uh, community comments. Um, Mike, can you facilitate those and reduce the comment time to one minute due to the overwhelming number of items that we have left? Can we just go to the, um, yeah, go to the bar right there? Sure, thank you. All right, Tessa Woodman, see. Okay, as we have seen uh, with the county distributing 75 million and saying it's hero pay, we have got to look at how we are dealing with our resources. And you know, a lot of this money that has come down is for resiliency. And that is what we are not going forward with. We need to think about when people, when the, the, the commenter about our food program says, we need to create you know, so self-sufficiency and being able to create our own food and being able to buy our own food. We need to be able to grow our own food. We need to, that needs to be our 100% focus is to bring this valley back into the Valley of Hearts Delight and teach us how to grow food. We need to become patrons of husbandry. This is what we all need to be starting to do. And that this, this, this stop gap of delivering food with fossil fuels and plastic and all the things that we're doing is all wrong. We need to have a waste free and a uh, you know, plastic free way of growing food. And that's what growing food for yourself does. You have no packaging. We need to learn to grow food. And this needs to be our focus of everything that we're going forward because that is solving our climate crisis and our food and our COVID crisis and all the future crises. We need to be putting money where our mouths are and growing. All right, Blair Beekman. Hi, thank you. Uh, to comment on the uh, food shortages issues we're having overall at this time, um, 
it, it's my concern that, you know, I felt that uh, back in, say, I don't know, May, we were, or was it April or March, that we were working on uh, issues of, of, of uh, support for, for grocery workers with a bit of a pay raise uh, at that time. I felt there was ways that we could be working through the summer and fall that would not bring out inflationary practices and um, we could continue good systems. Um, I don't think those things were fully followed well and followed through well. We needed to do that more. I think we would not be in this jam at this time that we're currently in. Uh, good luck how we're going to get out of this current situation uh, this fall with distribution issues and questions. A thank you for Tessa's words that, uh, you know, I hope we can find interesting green ways to address this problem. And uh, I wish it didn't have to come to this, but uh, good luck how we can work on it. Thank you. Chair, you can continue. Thank you, Mike. Um, we are going to go to my colleagues now. Um, Councilmember Sparza. Thank you. That um, equity uh, focus map, could you please put that back up on the screen? Um, yeah. You know, we've had upteen presentations to the council since COVID started. Um, we knew food was going to be an issue. I don't think, um, you know, I don't think any of us knew that a year and a half later we would have to be figuring out how to um, develop a long-term strategy because we're uh, distributing half a million meals, half a million meals to just 10 zip codes. Um, it, it's it this is it's mind blowing and um and and i i've shared some concerns before so i'm going to ask here and then i have one more question then i'll stop so um so one is i have seen in my district i have um and this was actually very helpful thank you in seeing the delivered meals by program as well as the others um you know <clears throat> So guess what, D5 and D7, to nobody's surprise, um, are the hardest uh, hit. And the fact that there are three zip codes for delivered meals that are over a million um, at the school sites is, uh, is, is indicative of fundamental needs within our community. And so I have seen it in my district where uh, our partners uh, because we're all facing limitations and our partners can't necessarily keep up. I, I see them being challenged and keeping up with the need. How are we going to um, not just support them more, but also how can we build other partnerships to build more redundancy in this very, very stressed food system? That's a great question. And I wish that I had a simple answer for you. Um, I think there's two ways that our team is addressing it right now. The first, as I mentioned, is that we are, we're gonna request funding to continue the program through uh, into 2022. As we ramp down, we wanna make sure that our partners are able to speak with the participants directly and make sure that either they don't need the food anymore or they have an alternative source to go to. We don't wanna leave anyone behind. So that's one prong. But then the second prong is the work that we're doing with the county because so many of the organizations that we work with are countywide. And um, we've started that work with the county. They're leading the, excuse me, they're leading the working group. Uh, they have us as participants, they have cities across the county and uh, different nonprofit organizations from the county that are starting that work. And the first thing that, one of the first things that came out of the meeting was the need to assess just getting that food map of where the services actually are right now. That's, we're starting from that baseline. Um, they've engaged the UC extension to help with that work. And already we're starting to provide data to them that we have and then the, the partners as well are providing that data. But because it's a complex system, we're not gonna be able to do it on our own. Uh, and so that's why we're working with the county to try to address that. 
Okay, yeah, thanks. And so you kind of just answered my second question, which is about working with the county. So I'll, I'll take what's little left of my time to really address a couple of things. Number one, we have over a million people living in San Jose. It's not possible to grow for everybody to take time out, particularly in my district where you have people working two or three jobs. Right now they're providing their own childcare because there isn't enough childcare and living multiple families to an apartment. And I realize that's not um, everyone's situation. There are some people that are fortunate to have homes with backyards and things like that. Um, and, uh, and I also want to address the second thing because it's been a topic of discussion. Um, costs have been going up, gas has gone up, food has gone up, utilities have gone up and are going to go up even more. It costs more just to live here, and everybody is feeling that, right? CJ, you mentioned buying food for a family of four. Like everybody sees this, and it doesn't matter what your income is, everyone deals with it. And the people who make the least are the most stressed, but it doesn't take away the fact that everyone is stressed and our middle class is stressed, and we need to worry about that. And there was a comment made about the county giving $76 million to their workers. Well, San Jose has given bonuses to our workers because we appreciate people who have worked seven days a week for most of this pandemic, who have worked very hard to keep people sheltered, keep them fed, keep our streets clean, keep our water plant going. And we need to focus on being appreciating that and actually solving problems instead of putting this discussion on the back of public service workers. That's it for me. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, since there isn't any other um, colleague whose uh, hand is up, I'm going to just ask a question about um, we're keeping track of the emergency allotments for SNAP and WIC, um, I think have recently ended. Um, do you foresee that um, putting pressure onto the reduction that we are making now and how are you um, allowing for that? Yeah, I, I certainly would see that putting pressure on it. And I think it goes back to this strategy where we're going to engage with the partners that are currently providing food and making sure they're talking with and communicating with participants about their needs to either connect them to resources or identify that they continue to need the support. And then our, also our request to continue the program into 2022. Thank you. Um, one of the things that um, I think for my district that impacts them is that we don't really have agencies and have, you've heard me say this before in our district that um, people can walk to and you know walk through the door and receive resources and things of that sort and so I'd like to just um, make sure that um, our Welch and our Meadow Fair area the one uh, by the uh, East Ridge that that continues to be supported. We do have a food distribution that is maintained and has been maintained for about 10 years by our neighborhood association, um, but it's once a month, right? And people uh, usually need something uh, more often than once a month. So I would ask for that uh, consideration. Um, I think, do we have a motion? I'll move to accept the report. I'll, I'll second it. I have a quick question. Perfect, Councilmember Cohen. Yeah, um, you're talking about you're talking about um, doing the breaks, winter, and I assume that's summer as well, and potentially during spring, uh, helping districts that have needs. What's the process by which districts are letting? Uh, how how is it being funneled? You say you're talking to the county office of education. Are districts being asked by the county office to to send their needs? if they have them directly through the county office or is there communication directly with school districts about what their needs might be? So uh, thank you for that question, council member. The process that we have done thus far, we did it last year as well, is that we work directly with the uh, Santa Clara County Office of Education. When we met with them a few weeks ago, their plan was to send out a survey to the school districts. School districts typically don't start planning for that quite yet. So she even I mentioned we're on the early side of planning. 
uh, she's sending out a survey to identify which schools would need support in the distribution. As it turns out, some schools do already plan with their own nutrition services to send meals and food home over the break. It's those schools that don't already have that plan that we need to identify where we need to step in. And if there are people in parts of the city that may not have the school district um, requesting that, but there are people with need, um, will there be a means by which they can go elsewhere to get help? So there's all the normal channels, um, right? Signing up for the different programs, signing up for the food bank uh, in order to get support. Um, if you hear of any, let us know and we can try to connect them to the right program. Uh, but that's what this point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Ruth, you are going to call roll for our vote, please. Jimenez? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Carrasco? Aye. Arenas? Yes. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Ruth. And we're moving on to item number three, which is Education and Digital Literacy Strategy Annual Report. This is our library department. And I will remind once again our speakers to please adhere to comments that are within this item. Uh, when the presentation is over. Go ahead. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Vidya Kilambi. I'm the division manager of education and innovation with the library. And today we will be providing a very succinct overview of the robust education and digital literacy annual update in the areas of early education, expanded learning, college and career readiness, digital literacy and governance. Staff approached each area of the education and digital literacy strategy by prioritizing the values of equity, opportunity, quality, and accountability. Next slide. The library and PNS provide several programs designed to meet the needs of children zero to five and their caregivers. Upon completion of the year one early education quality standards assessments and quality improvement plans, the library and PRNS were able to use the information gathered to inform year two priorities based on a con combination of community needs, department resources, professional development and training, and anticipated areas identified for growth and enhancement. Prior prioritized quality standing standard areas for each department are noted on the slide. Next slide. The library is continuously seeking to modify and adapt to the changing needs of the community while maintaining levels of intentional planning for high quality services. Using a combination of information from year two implementation of the early education quality standard standards, assessment results, caregiver survey data, strengthening family self-assessment results, and SGSU's final evaluation, the library has a certain private priority areas to focus on in the year three implementations, which are listed on the slide. In fiscal year 21-22, PRNS will continue to expand evidence-based best practices through a gradual phased-in approach in adherence to the early education quality standards to ensure a high quality early education and recreation program by implementing items listed on the slide. Next slide, please. In to help students with their homework in a distance learning environment, SJPL launched the Virtual Homework Lab from August 2020 until May 2021. An assessment of the program identified key areas of success, such as positive, welcoming space with organized structure, as well as specific areas of future volunteer trainings around best practices for one-on-one -on -one teaching and academic support. In 2021, PRNS offered Rock and Learn utilizing the ROC after school model to provide distance learning and childcare for families impacted by the pandemic. The program was offered at 15 community centers and parks and six libraries. Eligible families received a full scholarship and city staff worked closely with school districts and partner organizations to identify and refer students experiencing challenges with distance learning. City staff also worked with school districts to provide free lunches daily and secured shelf-stable meals for school holidays. 
In addition, PRNS provided ACES programs to 99 students at four schools. SJ Learns served 930 students across five school districts, Alam Rock, school, Alam Rock Union School District, Campbell Unified School District, Franklin McKinley School District, Luther Burbank, and Mount Pleasant Elementary School District. The expanded learning community of practice also shifted its design and professional learning model to more effectively support SJ Learns grantees in the context of distance learning. Next slide, please. For Homework Lab in, in the next, in fiscal year 21-22, the library will expand the application of the expanded learning quality standards in planning and assessment with quality, in, and also include quality improvement plans. For Rock After School, PRNS will continue to focus on the expanded learning quality standards with added focus on expanded learning quality standards six, equity, diversity, and access, expanding affordable access to children and youth programming. For SJ Learns, the library will continue to work with external evaluator and leverage a newly established partnership with DataZone to evaluate and better understand the impact of the SJ Learns grant program. And now I hand over the presentation to Michelle. Good afternoon, council members. I'm Michelle Arnott, Deputy Director of Public Services for the library. In the last fiscal year, milestones for college and crew readiness programs include adoption of quality standards, the award of 22 career online high school scholarships, an increase in students enrolled in SJ Aspires, and the transfer of the Youth Commission to the library. Teen volunteering went virtual, and SJ Works provided paid internships in sectors, including advanced manufacturing, business financial services, and information and communications technology. Next slide. Highlights of the college and career readiness work plan for this fiscal year include the finalization of the college and career readiness logic model and the development of program metrics and the assessment tool. A pilot assessment of college and career readiness quality standards in the SJ Aspires program. The integration of the management of the Youth Commission into teen HQ activities and the evaluation of the college and career readiness assessment tool in preparation to apply it to other programs in fiscal year 2022-2023. Next slide. In June 2021, the library began to roll out the training and implementation to a cohort of SJPL and PRNS staff currently engaged in hosting digital literacy related programming. Programs scored in the near, near emerging proficiency level and quality improvement plans were created. This fall, the effectiveness of those plans will be assessed as additional staff will be trained on digital literacy quality standards, implementations and assessment in the coming year. Final program scoring for the fiscal year will be completed in spring 2022. Next slide. Coding experiences expose participants to new learning opportunities and build skills like creativity, risk-taking, collaboration, and the idea that learning is a process rather than a product. The library is committed to providing coding experiences to students, especially in underrepresented neighborhoods. For the first time since the program's inception, the majority of participants identified as girls. Program highlights from last year include a continuation of the Apple Grant Program, which brought additional devices, workshops, and boot camps to students. Check out robotics classes, an expansion of the summer camp series to include asynchronous learning to meet the overwhelming demand, and new camp-focused topics such as speech and debate, and coding in the areas of college readiness, storytelling, and math. Next slide. Digital literacy classes were implemented through the grant received from the city's digital inclusion fund. The library adapted curriculum from the California Emerging Technology Fund to create four workshops, which were available through either through a weekly synchronous Zoom class or through an asynchronous Learn As You Go platform. In addition, 200 households were reached through a device loan to own program in partnership with CalWORKS, which assisted in reaching out to qualified families in San Jose. Participants were provided digital literacy curriculum and information about available library devices and low cost internet plans. Next slide. And the city's education policy was adopted in February 2020 and included in this policy is the school city collaborative. The collaborative meets twice annually and is inclusive of the mayor's office, city staff, the 
County Office of Education and District Superintendents. The Joint School Library Card Initiative continues with the priority to increase K through 12 student access to print and electronic resources and also include strengthening the relationship between city and school districts. Next slide. The library has partnerships with 18 local education agencies across 179 campuses, serving a little over 90,000 students. Bolded are the new local education agencies for the 21-22 acad academic school year. Each agency and schools are in the process of receiving promotional kits to support library card assistance and usage. Next slide. And this concludes our presentation. Staff is available to answer any questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mike, do we have uh, anyone from our community? Uh, yes, Chair, stand by. Um, let me go ahead and just connect the other presentation. Okay, Tessa Woodman, see. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, young people, are, you can hear me, I guess I don't have a little clock. Young people are anxious about climate change and say governments are failing them. And so basically what I'm saying is that Greta Thunberg, she stopped going to school. She started the school strike because we're not, she says, we're not listening to the science. Why should I go to school? We're not listening to the science. And this is, this is a really a critical part. And I wanted to thank Maya Esparza because she even looked at the fact of our need to grow food. She questioned it. She said, yes, we do not have, all of us have the, the emphasis of having that food, a, a land to grow food on. And this is a critical issue. Thank you, Maya Sparza, because that is what we need to do is we need to create in all of our neighborhoods, places to grow food locally. And also, of course, we can grow food. Ms. Woodman, see, There's this is about the education and right, 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 literacy right. So strategy. I'm, I'm talking, well, I'm talking about education because one of the main key parts of education in the Philippines is growing food. They have it within their home curriculum from K through 12. And we need to implement that. We need to have that as an in, in, an in, a very important part of our curriculum. Blair Beekman. Hi, thank you. Blair Beekman here. This is a really good item for myself because this is, you know, digital equity issues and digital inclusion that, you know, it's, it's a bit separate from my open public policy needs and ideas that I express in like the next upcoming item. Um, so thank you. This is good community efforts as this uh, public meeting process can be about. And I thank you for that you've tried to uh, allow me to, to speak today and gave me a little extra time. Um, on the previous item, I spoke to uh, issues that were not directly of what the agenda item was about, but I, I feel it offered it was about the agenda item. And what Tessa just offered was practices about, you know, educate the educational process. And, and, and for as much as you want us to focus on, on agenda items and that we do, I think there should be a little bit of latitude allowed to speak on, on broader issues around the agenda item subject matter that you have to learn to respect more. All right, phone number ending in 5140. Yes, yeah, since when does the city have to get involved? This is a school district. How, how much more micromanaging are you going to do to to uh, brainwash these children? You know, you got the police activities league. That's the city. You have the backpack giveaways. There's all these city intrusions into the school district. Every it seems like every level of government wants to be in brainwashing these kids, and you know they. It really doesn't make much sense for the city needs to take care of city infrastructure, not the school. The school is the San Jose Unified School District. You're not the school district. You guys can't even fill a pothole. You're going to start teaching kids things. You're going to start giving out internet for free and all this. That my internet that I pay for doesn't even work properly half the time. That's expensive because you guys haven't been able to put it together to do to do proper uh, infrastructure for telecommunications or work with the telecommunications people. In
Thank you. Um, we're going to move over to my colleagues, uh, Councilmember Cohen. Yeah, I, first I'll just move the acceptance of this report. And uh, yeah, and then just thank staff for, for the great work uh, providing these services for our students. Um, the library literacy programs are an integral part of the early childhood education in our city. And I also want to um, put in a plug for the after school programs like Rock and others because without them, many of our students wouldn't have a place to go after school. And so I, it's really, really important to our school districts that the city offers these services. And so I thank you for that and thank you for this report. Seeing that there is no more hands for my colleagues, I will be asking some questions. Okay. Um, I also want to just start off by thanking you for the presentation. It's very informative, very concise. Um, this was, uh, I think, 14 pages long in terms of a, of a memo. And so there's a lot of really good information. Um, and behind that good information is uh, some wonderful efforts that have been exerted. Um, to meet the needs of our children while we are distance learning and to meet the needs of our parents in our community, um, as it is the responsibility of all of us who live together um, to be uh, accountable to one another. And so um, in, in that spirit, I wanted to ask about the digital literacy. Um, it's on page uh, 16, and these are coding summer camps I was hoping that we could have a breakdown of zip codes and we can take this offline. Um, obviously, I don't expect that response right now. Um, I know in the past, um, there's been a really good effort in terms of, of targeting uh, folks who are in certain zip codes. I just wanted to make sure and to learn about my zip code uh, specifically, I'm sure my colleagues are interested in their respective ones um, and to see how, how that played out um, for folks. In the end, I'm always asking for us to target um, the folks who we don't normally target and those are the hardest to reach uh, kiddos. Uh, they're, they're the same, uh, you know, in terms of effort and resources, it takes a lot to connect with some of these, those who are hard to reach and um, we, we need to make sure that we have an outreach uh, strategy that works um, for them and with them. Uh, have you I, you know, this isn't just in general. What is what is our our library department doing differently to ensure that we connect with um, some of those hard to reach folks, the ones that may not be interested in, um, you know, uh, going to the to the camp, uh, digital camp, or uh, doing some of this homework, or not? Maybe do, they don't know. They just don't know about these opportunities. How do, how do we get to those kiddos? Vidya, do you wanna take that one? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, so we, have, we use a variety of ways that we outreach um, to our communities. We work with the school districts. We work with the community partners. Um, we also um, um, do our, you know, go out into the community and meet people where they are. So these are different strategies we use, um, sometimes, um, and with varying different degrees of success, of course. Sure. Um, I would be um, interested in just connecting with you offline, and my team can connect just to make sure that um, we give you some of our contacts for some of our of course. Uh, folks that we've built relationships with in that way you know you don't have to do the same work um and we, we have some really great jumping off points which are project hope sites and neighborhoods that already have been invested in through um outreach workers and and some of neighborhood um development of leaders there and so i think that's another really great source um to include into an outreach strategy. Um, I just saw Jill pop in um, <laughs> on the squares. Jill, did you wanna add something? Yeah, thank you. No, I was just say I, everything that Vidya said, but I literally just yesterday we we're having this conversation about 
specifically with these types of programs, coding programs, and we would love to work with your offices and your colleagues around that identity development, you know, that we've talked about, about attracting kids to these types of programs who might not naturally be drawn to them. And how, you know, as Vidya said, a number of efforts have been made, and I think attendance has, has grown over time especially, um, you know, as you heard the, the more girls in the programs when we started, that was not the case. It's really great. Um, but we recognize we still really want to um, get these programs into neighborhoods where kids are not naturally gravitating towards them. So we would love your assistance. I love that, Jill. Um, you know, we have Overfelt in, in our backyard in, in Silver Creek and um, really happy to work with you on either one of those and and our junior high kiddos right i mean just um everyone um the the other piece i was going to ask about was um oh gosh where do i have this okay so i love that you all shifted on to the virtual homework club um i knew about that um before this report came in um those are great numbers that you all have um i wanted to see if you collected any information about the zip codes these kiddos live in? I would like to ask Lizzie if she's here to weigh yeah, in. You know what, Vidya, we can, we can take this offline. Okay, all right, um, thank you. If you collect the information, we can get this offline. No okay. worries yes. about that. The, the other feedback that's connected to that virtual homework club, I was wondering, um, because it looked like it was uh, pretty successful, have we thought about any coordination with some of the rock sites, um, being that we have these kiddos in our care um, after, after school, potentially from 3 to 6 p.m.? Is there, has there been any... Um, any ideas rolling around there about maybe uh, uh, connecting with some of these rock students? We've been discussing that, so that's a great idea. So we'll continue with that discussion. Wonderful. I, I, I think that there is an, also another opportunity for a resiliency core. I saw that, that, mm -hmm. you, that you are all making really great progress in, in that um, track as well. And so I think those are really good places to join forces where um, we might be serving the same kiddo and this kiddo probably doesn't have time to go to two different programs um, and so why not bring all those three into one um, I do want to last yes go ahead video I, I do want to add that for the coding programs we did work with the rock and learn sites for the coding program I did. and so the yes. yeah yeah just, I did see that. That's that's fabulous. I love that. I really um, appreciate it. I love that that you're all thinking about our children in a very comprehensive way. Um, and uh, I know from, and I'll tell you, as a mom, because you know we we are some of us here are moms, and um, and some of our kiddos need a little bit of tutoring, and so I personally use a rock program, and. <laughs> And what I, you know, and my kiddos also uh, benefit from tutoring that I, I pay for, um, and I'm happy to do that, but it does take um, more time for, for our kiddos that sometimes are overwhelmed, right? If they join a sport or they join something after school, and then to do uh, tutoring aside from, it, it just gets to be a lot, and any way that we can bring a service to our kids, I would love. Um, and the last piece is um, on the series of, of virtual um, trainings, which I love to hear about for the recreation leaders who are primarily um, the staff members who um, feed the rock programs. Um, there, there has a series of them. And I was wondering if child reporting, child abuse reporting is one of those um, topics. Laura, I see you shaking your head. That yes, Council Member Rennes, yes. Mandated reporter is one of them. Perfect. We what also are... follow the uh, expanded learning quality standards and take a look at some of the domains in those areas to make sure that we're hitting some of those areas in our training. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, that I have seen um, 
and that we all probably knew way ahead of time is that social emotional issues are going to be springing up for our children and how are we going to address it I know that our schools most have uh, our children for most of the day, but that doesn't mean that they're entirely responsible. That if any time, you know, a child makes a contact with us, that we also are responsive. And I know that you all um, are on board with this, um, but I wanted to learn in a very practical manner, how, how do we apply that, right? How do we check in with our children, whether they're in rock or, um, if it's a class that we're going to begin to offer, um, or if we're, you know, I think at this point we're not starting our classes just yet uh, completely, um, but how do we bring some of those services to our kiddos? Um, I was talking to the principal of my kiddos, my daughter's school, um, because my daughter witnessed something to, uh, that happened with her um, friend and classmate there in first grade, um, by the way. And this, this little girl fell and uh, she fell from the playground uh, monkey bars. And so, she, you know, her nose was bleeding. And, um, and here comes another kid, um, another kiddo who begins to kick and hit her while she's down. I mean, you know, most adults don't even do that in a, in a fight. I would expect to see this at a high school level, or junior high level. I don't, I don't know, but uh, um it really astounded me that the the kind of uh, lack of empathy maybe from these kids or or maybe they're repeating or uh, emulate uh, imi uh, imitating something that they've seen at home or they're, that they're being impacted by and um, and when I was talking to the principal about it um, uh, you know, he said that he they they were having more uh, issues with our little ones than our first, second, third graders rather than our no, first and second graders rather than the third and fourth and fifth. Um, and so, uh, you know, we just have to be careful at every age level uh, in terms of what we're doing and and to um, be as as diligent as we can be anytime they come into our um, into our network of services. And so. I know that I have been telling people to keep their uh, comments and questions short, and I have not obliged, but because I didn't see any ra raised hands, I took a little bit of liberty. Now that I see uh, Council Member Esparza, um, I'm going to end my uh, questions. Just thank you for all of that you're doing. I know I'm giving you some feedback, but um, I really want, I don't want that to um, dampen all the efforts that I know that have been made throughout this last year, because they have been, You've, you have uh, helped us um, maybe restore some level of normalcy for our children and stability. And that means quite a bit for our kids, um, whether it's in the library or in our community centers or in our um, schools. I, I just really wanna thank you for, for being those advocates for our, our kids. Um, and and never really giving up uh, because you know it's hard it's hard to serve youth I've done it before and it's exhausting and so thank you for for your service and thank you for this presentation okay Council Member Esparza sure I'll be super quick I um, I also would like to see the zip code level and I think we brought that up at the last um, the last time this came up um, to NSE so if uh, that if, if that could just be sent to us offline um, so we don't have to wait for the next presentation um, I'm, I'd love to see that level of detail um, I, I also really wanted to make one sort of another connection which is how important um, and, and you addressed it really well in the presentation in terms of um, equity and the isolation and trying to reach families, but there's a connection also with health. Um, and I know we're seeing a, a lot, um, and, and it's kind of interesting, um, County Supervisor Joe Smidian uh, and led an effort by the county to just launch something in North County for more high school mental health services, um, because kids up there were you know, attempting and sometimes successfully to commit suicide. And it was just, they were, they're stressed and their anxiety. And it's interesting. I see it in my district, which, you know, you wouldn't think that we have these commonalities, but I just think it shows that 
um, no matter what your background is, we're all stressed in this pandemic. And in some communities, you combine all of these and it adds up and we have communities that are a breaking point. And the connection with digital literacy and health is, I think, another really important issue that we need to connect. And I said that was last, but that's not last. One more thing, because I, um, I almost forgot, which I, I would also um, love to talk more in advance the next time about the coding programs. Um, I think our program is a little bit more unique in that it's a camp. Um, uh, there are other coding programs which are more short term, um, which, uh, you know, I'll tell you the schools in my district uh, don't like because it's like come in for a day, get some great photos and then you leave but our program is, is more intensive. And I'd like to have a conversation next time about outreach, um, how we can outreach to really give these opportunities to kids who um, may not have, uh, for whom this would be a reach, right? Extra, extra special. And so um, I would like to have that discussion um, before the camps are sort of finalized next time, because I think it's a precious resource. That's it for me, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Sparza. We'll definitely follow up with you and Council Member Arenas in, in that outreach for um, working with the council district offices to, to reach the people where they are. Thank you. And you know, Council Member Sparza, you bring up a really good point about junior, I mean high school students. I was just told by um, uh, somebody um, that I know um, uh, that their daughter goes to Milpitas High and uh, there was a death in this week of a, of a high school student. And, uh, and so, you know, it's, it's, the stress is very real to our children and it's going to change them in very drastic ways and uh, create a, a larger gap um, for our, you know, between those kids who have and those kids who don't. Um, so um, thank you for, for all the work that you're doing in the moment, um, library and our PRNS department uh, for all our kiddos out there. Can I get a motion? Move to accept and approve. Second. Awesome. Ruth, take us away. Or Mike. Jimenez? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Carrasco? Aye. Arenas? Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Wonderful. We're going to move on to item number four. And this is Digital Literacy and Public Technology Status Report. Um, we have our library and uh, I believe our PRNS department. Yes, good afternoon, uh, Chair Arenas, committee members, colleagues, and members of the public. I'm Jill Bourne, city librarian and lead in the digital equity priority area of the city roadmap. So I'm here today with Ann Grabowski, who um, wears many hats, but is here today as the division manager for digital equity. Today, we're gonna be providing a comprehensive update on the digital inclusion and digital equity efforts of the city. Another update, though not identical, was provided this month at the Smart Cities Committee. So this update will focus primarily on the efforts that initiated from the pandemic and its extreme impact on everyone, including our students and our most vulnerable, least connected households. Many of the standard digital literacy programs that were originally included in this agenda item were already reported on in the education and digital literacy update that was just heard and discussed. So today we wanted to provide you with some informational updates on the programs and efforts that city council and this committee are very familiar with by now, but also focus a little bit more on the human outcome and impacts of these efforts in our communities. And I will turn it over to Anne. Thanks so much, Jill. Um, as Jill said, I'm Ann Grabowski. I'm the division manager for digital equity at the library and overseeing the citywide digital equity efforts under our emergency operation. To preserve time for discussion and feedback, we're going to move through some of our slides fairly quickly. Um, however, to start, I feel it's very important to begin at the very center of our work, which is equity. 
here you see the Digital Inclusion Priority Index map, which is a compilation of data by Census Tract that serves as the basis for all of our decision making and scoping of the work that we've undertaken. We've discussed this map at length, so we won't get into it again, but it's important for you to know that we're still using this data for decision making and we're excited to update the index when the new 2020 census data is released in the upcoming months. This slide you've also seen before, this slide recaps the work that was completed at the close of the last fiscal year and illustrates the breadth and depth of the effort and the community impact that this work is accomplishing. On to the status updates. Uh, starting with community Wi-Fi, you'll see that project broken up into three areas on this slide. Customer experience and outreach in existing areas, network design and construction in new areas under development, and sustainability and management of the community Wi-Fi program. Each work item is moving along as expected, and while some items have barriers to overcome, which are noted in yellow, none of the items are significantly impacted at this time. Um, you should note that the council will have an action item on next week's agenda to change a contract allocation for one of our community Wi-Fi vendors. So don't be surprised to see that next week. Um, as we move forward to the other half of the program, the hotspot um, and device program is ongoing and providing important support to the community, as is the affordable and digital literacy adoption programming. Again, from a status update perspective, there are no items that are significantly impacted. Diving in a little bit deeper, the first program area that we'll focus on today is community Wi-Fi. As mentioned on the status update slide, our focus in year two is really bifurcated between a focus on the experience for the customer and um, the service provided in the existing networks, as well as the continued build out of new areas. To ensure that we're providing a quality experience, we're embarking on a large data aggregation project that will integrate infrastructure data from our network equipment with live customer feedback gathered through survey responses that we think will be collected through the San Jose 311 app. To ensure that families are aware of the services available in their neighborhoods, we're overhauling the public information that's available on the city and library websites and are launching a large scale marketing um, outreach and awareness campaign. Meanwhile, the existing networks continue to show sustained traffic and use by the community. I do wanna note on these graphs um, that the drop in users and traffic in June was due to missing data and not an outage, but we have seen sustained use of the networks and an increase in use as school has resumed. The design and construction of new community Wi-Fi networks is progressing mostly on schedule, though the project is seeing the same impacts as regular, the regular market is with labor shortages and inflation. Um, impacts to, to timeline. So nothing is significantly off schedule. And the team at Public Works has done an extraordinary job keeping things on track um, and anticipating problems before they become problems. And so just a quick shout out to, to our team there. They've done extraordinary work to bring all of this to fruition. We will be bringing these area, we will be bringing three areas into operation in the first half of 2022. And you see that as the Independence, Andrew Hill, and Oak Grove areas. Um, one in the last half of 2022 and one in early 2023. We'll shift our focus to hotspots and device distribution. The committee is well aware of the significant support that the city has provided to our school partners through the distribution of hotspots. And um, those were fully funded over the last academic year and are fully funded again this academic year. I'm really thrilled to share that students that received a hotspot last academic year attended 93% of their classes, which is an outstanding benchmark for such a tumultuous year, especially when the alternative was no attendance at all. Our library hotspots were checked out nearly 10,000 times and tech support was provided in four languages through chat, in-person help and video tutorials. We did have plans to hear from the IT director at Franklin McKinley School District today, but unfortunately he had to leave at 3 p.m. So we'll just appreciate our partner uh, and hope to hear from them again in the future. Let's see, I'm excited to share that while our hotspots have been checked out 100% across our system since the spring, we recently received 1,200 new hotspots, which are being distributed throughout the branches this week and next. 
the council has been made aware of our purchasing plans for hotspots this year. And this slide is really just a recap of, of what those plans are. Um, but we are excited that we've got 1,200 new hotspots uh, available for the public very shortly. This slide, so probably difficult to read, um, is the baseline allocation of hotspots at branches. This table shows you the number of existing hotspots, um, which is, is here. Um, the new hotspots that we're distributing into the branches this week and next, and the allocation of new youth hotspots that we will purchase and distribute once we receive an emergency connectivity fund award from the federal government. The new total that you'll see available to each community through the branches is available in this second to last column. We could not do this work alone. Uh, this slide offers a quick glimpse of only half of the partners that have come alongside us as we've developed and executed these programs. And we're excited to re-engage, um, well, we're, we are engaged with many of them and re-engage more of them as we have additional hotspots available through the library um, and seek their assistance in making sure that those hotspots go into the homes of people who are the most in need. Last but not least is our focus on adoption and affordability programming. Our team will continue to execute and strengthen the existing systems for referrals to affordable internet plans and tech support, as well as streamline our communication efforts. Most importantly, I, want to I wanted to show a video of our friend Eva, a parent and library digital literacy program participant. The timing of this meeting is difficult for parents and program participants to, to join and share their thoughts. Um, but we do have a video that I'm going to attempt to share now and hope that it would work. Um, if it doesn't work, then what we will do is, um, is we will post it for, um, for everyone to view afterwards. Is anyone hearing sound? No. Okay. No. Yes, we can hear you. But but you couldn't hear the video, could you? No, we no, can't hear sorry. the video. Okay. okay. Then what we'll do is we will just post it. Um, we will just post it. With that, I will turn it back over to Jill um, to close us out today. Thanks, Anne. Um, and so before we conclude, this slide just provides an overview of the various resources and services that are available to all. And you'll see that each starts by going to sjpl.org. You can borrow a hotspot, a device, a tablet, computer, get free Wi-Fi, or take a digital literacy class. And then um, to emphasize that part of our work plan for the current year is to develop a consolidated landing page for all relevant city programs to initiate an outreach and marketing effort to increase awareness and engagement with these programs, and then to design the new data collection and study process to understand the current community need around technology and connection, essentially updating the study that was done in 2017, which formed the early basis for any many of our digital inclusion efforts, but also to engage the community in shaping and executing that study. So with that, I wanna thank the committee again and welcome any questions and be back. Great, thank you so much for the presentation. We're gonna to go to our community members for public comment. And I just like to please uh, remind you that uh, this is to please keep your comments to digital literacy and public technology status report. Thank you. Yes, it would, Mincy. Thank you very much for repeating the topic. That's very helpful, um, Sylvia. And on top of that, um, I guess you can hear me good. I think you can, right? The, the clock is not working. But the issue is I'm having trouble getting free Wi-Fi. So, you know, for low-income people. So it's not working very well. And so maybe that little link that uh, uh, she gave us, the San Jose Public Library, will help me get free Wi-Fi. Not, not necessarily free, but reduced. And my particular uh, vendor said, oh, well, we have voice over IP, so we can't, we weren't allowed to, I forget the name of the vendor, but, you know, to give us the reduced rate. 
So anyway, getting back to issues also about our city in regards to technology is that I have, un can understand why our city is not able to uh, forward voice over IP, the phone, to come to so that we can reach out to our democracy. There is no contact. We, I have, there is no contact with the city. This is really a problem. And, I, you know, you hear Mayor Licardo says, I will kill you if you want to work at home. Almost. He almost says that because he wants to keep economic growth growing in his city and the restaurants and the businesses downtown. And so he hasn't made it a policy to have you able to work at home. And that's ridiculous. We need to be able to. Blair Beekman. Hi, thank you. Blair Beekman here. Um, you know, this item is good community items uh, that actually speak to a very wide range of issues, including, you know, there's downtown Wi-Fi installation you've just gone through that uh, really seems to signify ideas of uh, geofencing and what will need, be needed as good open public policy ideas and practices for this downtown project. Um, you know, I know you guys do do good work with these things but it's, it's just important that I try to remind ourselves of these things. And uh, I apologize, I was a little loud uh, at Smart Cities last week. If you're trying to do good work at this, uh, the ideas of working hand in hand, uh, you know, with digital uh, equity and, and open public policy, I, I think they should work hand in hand in the future. Uh, kids are getting all this, you know, important, good, new digital tech, but they need good practices of civil rights and civil protections and open public community policies so they can better define the future of this tech. Thank you. Um, moving into my, to our colleagues, onto my colleagues, uh, Council Member Sparza. Thank you for the presentation. In the interest of time, I'm just gonna ask one question. Um, which is uh, if you can explain the partnership with Helium and how it works to contribute to the hotspot project. Thank you for the question, council member. Um, the partnership with Helium actually is um, managed solely through the mayor's office and a partnership that the mayor's office has with the California Emerging Technology Foundation. The administration has not engaged in that um, project or participated in its scoping or administration. So my understanding of the project is probably um, not up to a level that would actually benefit the committee, um, but we can certainly ask for additional information and provide that back to the committee if you'd like. That would be great. And, and that's it for me, Madam Chair. Thank you. Great, great. thank you so much. Um, I have uh, just a couple of questions. Um, what is the timeline for um, to to uh, work on the continue to work on the network? Um, I know that there's been some analysis um, uh, for some of the existing areas, um, and uh, I realize that there's been some some increase in, in um, unique IPs in, in, um, in your um, report. And I, uh, and I heard you, Jill, saying that there's gonna be a, a deeper analysis, but what, when, what is that timeline? Um, when are we, when it, what does that look like? I think there's a, there's a twofold approach to this. I mean, to speak more to the, um, the work that's being done to improve the current network as it's um, being implemented. And uh, because we've talked about how the attendance areas don't always match up with the um, households in need. Right. So there's that, that work. And then the, the deeper study where we, we would be initiating this, the scoping uh, during this current fiscal year. And I don't have a, a firm timeline, but we can certainly bring that back. But Anne, perhaps uh, you know more about the timeline working with the vendors on the current networks. That work is um, underway. We've realized several of our kind of, not shortcomings, but areas where we need to strengthen our infrastructure so that we can actually do proper analytics um, in a sustainable way for this, for this work, especially as the network that we're going to be receiving data from will grow, will double by the close of the fiscal year. So there is some work to do on 
servers and um, storage of the records. Our city data architect told me yesterday that they had over 100 million records that was crashing a server uh, that were coming in from, from the network. So you can appreciate some of the infrastructure struggles that we're having on that side. Um, that being said, we do have a path to overcome several of those struggles. And we're looking at a spring, like a February, March timeline to actually be able to manage the data, digest it appropriately, and come up with analytics that are, that are more detailed um, and insightful than just the number of unique IDs and um, the traffic. So maybe we can work on, um, you know, that, that timeline that we've used for some time now on each of the networks of, in the attendance areas, maybe we can overlay with that some of the other work that we've been talking about that is now funded. Um, including the assessment of the current networks and this ginormous data project and the, the future um, community engagement and the, the potential 311 uh, feedback loop as well. And we can, for, for our next update, we can make sure to have a more robust timeline. Wonderful. Maybe a graph on that. <laughs> that sounds like a, a complicated thing that you're going to do. Uh, good graphics uh, would be appreciated. Um, the other question I have is, uh, I, so I noticed that, that I think there were 60% of students that uh, um, qualified as uh, disadvantaged, as socially, economically disadvantaged, and um, those folks receive those folks um, benefit from some of the hotspots that are moving through the library, which I really appreciate. Um, and it, and it seemed like the hotspots were the item that was most used. Um, as opposed to some of the uh, Chromebooks, um, and and even though that's that's what the demand is, um, there's still I think more um, purchases that are going to be made towards devices. Um, how do we how how do we align for for what we see as a constant need and what you, you hope, I, I'm thinking, I don't know if you're projecting some future use with the purchase of, of devices that, you're, that, that are being made. I didn't know if you're gonna jump in, Anne. Um, the, I think that the, the original um, a number of Chromebooks, it re remind me, Anne, that that was given to us through uh, another source. And the part of the issue was that they were not connected um, devices. So you had to have a hotspot and the device, which seems somewhat cumbersome for mm -hmm. especially folks who are learning new technology. And so I believe our goal in the future is to provide connected devices, um, but we do still have a, a demand for that, especially in the digital literacy programming world with adults that uh, they, they need to learn how to use the device as while they're being taught, you know, how to protect their privacy online, how to search for a job, like all those different elements that come together. Mm -hmm. uh, we still do see a need for devices, but I think the point that we need to balance it to, to meet the demand is well taken. Thank you. Um, I know that you've been checking in with our school districts and I really appreciate that. Um, I. I or at least the ones that I've been connecting with. Um, but there are some who have decided, like and we've talked about this before, who have decided to end their um, lending programs internally. And so it's up to the library to really uh, uh, provide an, another uh, source of, of lending, uh, either for hotspots or devices. Um, but how, and how is that information or how is that, is there any coordination between some of those districts that decided or schools that decided to end their, their programs or is that we working independent of, of each other? Is that they're communicating with, oh, sorry, go ahead, Anne. Yeah. I was gonna ask for clarification. Do you, are you, are you asking how, how the folks who were formerly served by that school district would find out how to still get service through the city? Right, right. Are we working with them? Yeah. Do you have an answer, Anne? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we are we are working with all all LEAs that we were originally working with, um, including a broader 
array of those who didn't even work with us the first time. There's several um, smaller charter schools that declined our offer for hotspots last year that we continue to provide information to about library services because we appreciate that they're part of our, our ecosystem and they should everyone should avail themselves of the benefits of the library. To answer specifically about the seven LEAs that are not providing hot, our hotspots and a few within that group that are not providing any hotspots, um, we continued to check in with them. We check in with them about once a month and they've received or will receive the, um, the school packet of information about SJ Access and the other library services that are available. And in the next month or so, they'll receive the um, city supports that have like eviction moratorium, rent relief, oh, uh, food great. distribution, all of those. So we're continuing to provide all of that information to the community it's a little bit difficult to understand what the school implements um, based on what we mm -hmm. provide them. Um, and we're continuing to do our due diligence and try and understand how deep that message is penetrating into the families as well. Yeah, I know that, um, and this is just for an event um, and I'm not trying to reduce the efforts because my ours is just an event, but what we do to, when, to not notify folks within our school districts, we know that there's some schools that respond better to a, um, you know, paper. They just, they want to hold on to something, pin it up on their fridge or, or wherever they post it as a reminder. Um, and so we provide actual flyers, um, hard copies uh, for some of those schools because we don't want to leave anybody out. I wonder if maybe this is an approach for some of the schools. I'm not saying let's do it for <laughs> every school out there, but if you know that there's some that respond better um, to that, uh, because those are probably the ones that are the hardest to reach and, and, and maybe the one of the most um, easiest forms of outreach where, you know, it really, it, it really um, benefits the, the, the recipient um, without too much resource being spent. So anyways, I, I, I'm hoping that maybe you can take that up. I know in the meantime, there's gonna be a little bit more that, um, that uh, will build into a package of other resources um, as you were talking and you're folding in housing information and, and, and whatnot. Um, I, Remember, if I could just, sure. just really quickly, I'm so sorry, to connect it back to the EDL update, um, every school will be getting a packet of paper updates and paperless um, opportunities and options for their for distribution and everybody's getting fence banners. So as you drive around San Jose, you're also going to see banners on school fences about SJ access and about school library cards, which is really exciting. So we absolutely yeah. agree with you. Oh, that's great. I love it. Next, uh, I'll, I'll see you on the side of a bus. <laughs> I'll, I'll definitely on our delivery trucks. I think they're going to be outfitted as well with SJ access information as they drive oh, around the great. state. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. I know that uh, our neighborhoods need to continue to learn about um, San Jose access and, and really um, access it in a way that is meaningful to them, right? Um, so I appreciate all those efforts. All right, uh, that's the end of my questions. Can we get a motion? Move to approve. Second. Wonderful. Ruth, take us away. Jimenez? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Carrasco? Aye. Arenas? Yes. Thank you. Perfect. Next, we have item number five, and this is citywide age-friendly action plan and older adult senior services programs status report. This is by our Parks and Recreation Neighborhood Services Department. Um, I see Maria de Leon, so hoping. Hi, welcome. Um, go ahead and begin. Okay, let me get my. So good afternoon, Madam Chair, committee members, city manager's office, and residents joining us today. My name is Maria de Leon, and I'm the deputy director for PRNS's Recreation Division. Today, we're here to bring you an update on our senior services programs and our age-friendly efforts. So our senior services team has worked diligently not only to um, 
move our services into a virtual environment, but also to move our in-person congregate meal program into a curbside pickup model. So our staff did all this with such a compassion, empathy, and efficiency, leading to an increase of 146% this past year. Way to go, PRNS. So today I'm joined by Jeremy Schaffner, who's a recreation superintendent who will provide updates on our programs and services. Uh, as well as our age-friendly efforts. Uh, we will be available for questions and comments following the presentation. Thank you so much for your continued support and advocacy. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jeremy. Thank you, Maria. Good afternoon, Chair, committee members. Jeremy Schaffner, Recreation Superintendent, Parks, Recreation, and Neighborhood Services. As we're all aware, it's been a challenging year. While challenging, it also has highlighted the creativity passion and dedication of our senior services teams within PRNS. In the past year, we have successfully transitioned from an in-person congregate meal program to a curbside pickup model that included additional meals to those who needed them, along with shifting programs to a virtual environment while addressing wellness checks to support one of our most vulnerable populations. The successes in support of our teams continue to grow and will continue to change as we work to return to in-person programming and in-person congregate meals. As you can see from this slide, our senior services team has been very busy in shifting to a new model of providing nutritious meals to our older adults. The daily average doubled with our overall meals increasing by 146%. Fabulous job by the teams. In addition to these meals, our team was successful in also providing residents with shelf-stable meals through SourceWise, which supported older adults who did not have access to meals over the weekend or during extended holiday closures. In addition to meals, our team also supported older adults and their families in gaining awareness and access to the Virtual Local Assistance Center, or as some of you might better know it as the BLAC. The teams made participants aware of this resource to support them during the pandemic and hopefully ease some of that uh, what they were experiencing. Our senior services team will conduct an in-person survey during meal pickups and programs in the month of November, in which the outcomes will help us determine the next steps, capacity, and support of continued access to nutritious meals. Overall, the goal of our senior services team is to return to in-person programming and meal service as soon as possible, while supporting a safe environment for our participants, volunteers, and staff. In addition to our focus on nutritious meals, our team also worked creatively to pro provide our older adults with options to access programs, services, and overall reduce social isolation while keeping our participants safe. The teams did this through multiple efforts, including virtual activities ranging from paint to exercising. The team was also successful in securing a grant from SourceWise that would provide digital devices to our clients in which our teams then helped them our seniors, our active adults, on how to access and utilize services via those devices. Overall, our team focused on ways to engage and support our older adults in creative and supportive ways. One additional effort that our team initiated was to remove all membership fees from our programs to reduce any financial barriers and create an incentive to sign up for memberships that would increase our team's ability to communicate with older adults and provide them with valuable updates, access to resources, and food opportunities. This has been a great success, and our team will continue with this effort as we progress into in-person programming. The team anticipates resuming some in-person programming the first week of November with online and in-person class registration starting October 20th. Classes will vary by center depending on the interests of our older adults, instructor volunteer availability and classroom space. While many centers will not resume all of their previous services, they will continue to add more programs until we get back to a full operation, as is the goal with all of our senior services programs. We continue to focus on engaging our participants in a supportive and fun environment while also creating a safe place for them to do so. Our senior services team provides a wide range of services and support. A critical component of our team to be successful is through partner partnership with other organizations to provide a well-rounded program and service. 
One example is our senior health and wellness grant efforts. During the pandemic, many of these services and partners were shifted to virtual or reduced to meet COVID-19 operating guidelines. Our team is currently working with our administrative services division within PRNS to finalize the upcoming senior health and wellness grant grantees and their services. The program will continue to, to provide our older adults with valuable services to improve and support their quality of life along with transitioning back to in-person services and programming. During the pandemic, many of our team was shifted into emergency roles supporting various efforts, including food and necessities. As our teams continue to transition back from those assignments, we will continue to focus on the Age-Friendly City Initiative and utilize it as a framework to guide and support us in bringing back programs that support age-friendly initiatives and its recommendations. During the pandemic, our team worked with our partners in DOT to support Vision Zero efforts. These efforts included participating in virtual senior advisory meetings, presenting information on how to be safe when walking their neighborhoods or when coming to the community center to pick up their meals. But also it provided handouts that would support our older adults in being safe in general, walking in their neighborhoods, getting out and getting exercise. In the upcoming year, staff will be focused on updating implementation plan provided in the age-friendly report, engaging stakeholders to reconvene the age-friendly advisory board, including internal departments, county partners, community-based organizations, and our own senior commission. Reconvene the quarterly, we will also reconvene the quarterly age-friendly advisory collaboration meetings to update on current efforts and coordinate future efforts as described in the age-friendly initiative. As you can see from our presentation, our senior services team has been very busy and will continue to be busy in the upcoming future. This is an exciting time as we are able to start returning to in-person programming and services. Our team will begin some activities and programming the first week of November with evaluation of our, of our in-person congregate meals as well. The goal is to resume all services to in-person while looking at opportunities to continue some of our virtual programs that support older adults who might not be ready to come back or are unable to do so. Our, our team is excited to see our participants in person and will continue to engage and support our older adults with a creative, compassionate, and supportive focus. Thank you again for having us today and we're available for any questions and or comments. Thank you. Uh, love the graphics and the pictures, by the way. Um, we're gonna move into uh, public comment. Go ahead, Mike. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Okay. Thank you so much, yes. Yeah, that was a good um, presentation. But as we are looking at our uh, our Charter Review Commission in regards to all our fossil fuel use. This is very critical in every department. So in regards to the department that you know, is delivering food, it all needs to go on a bicycle, okay? The way we deliver food, food has to reduce our, our, our carbon footprint. And so either we can get electric bicycles with carts, things like that. That's what we need to start uh, rethinking every department, how we go forward. And the other issue is even in regards to um, like the, the agri hood that is over in Santa Clara, over by the Winchester. You know, we need the, the beautiful activity for elders is gardening and growing food. And so, and connecting to nature, growing food is connecting to nature. We have def, uh, nature deficit disorder. And so we need to be outside and that's the beautiful thing. That's what Alry Middlebrook is doing and creating what they call 25 by 25. And that we need to have um, food, food gardens all over our city. And this would be an activity for seniors as you know, well as um, intergeneration. And so that's what we need to move towards is creating. Blair Beekman. Hi, thank you. Blair Beekman here. Um, just a reminder uh, with these senior issues that um, the work that I'm doing with open public policies is it's good practices that I think uh, they, they would recognize that I, I would think uh, it would invite some sort of cognitive abilities uh, for themselves if they're trying to learn about, uh, you know, the future of use of computers, uh, how to work the internet, to, to have a, a foundation based on, on civil rights and civil protection practices, and that the work they'll be doing on a computer is based on, you know, open democratic ideals and, and 
you know, civil rights, good protection ideas, civil protection ideas, I think that can help introduce them to the future of the internet process and what really we can all be working on to develop uh, for the future of, of our uh, technology and, and computer society. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, taking it back to our council or committee, I don't see any questions um, and I only have one. I do have a question about, um, so you have the senior wellness, health and wellness grant program and um, you, I think there was an RFP that just went live in uh, July. Um, and I think there's, there's going to be some um, awarded awards to agencies to begin work in October this month. Um, and I was hoping to hear from you, what are some of the equity considerations that have been factored into this uh, selection of grantees and, um, and maybe the, what, 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 how was, how were their locations determined? Um, any information on that? Absolutely. I, I'm able to provide, provide you some general information. We actually just had met with the team this morning. Uh, we also met last week in regards to the equity. Um, the team has been using our equity maps uh, in which there were seven identified areas, um, and those were prioritized within the RFQ so that uh, grantees that were applying and providing services within those uh, seven areas um, were um, essentially given uh, weight or given additional um, priority, um, additional remarks. So I'm, I'm not sure of the exact word. I'm failing to find that exact term, unfortunately, uh, from our contracts team. But I know that they had done that. That is being looked at. That is one of the criteria we're looking at. We are actually in the process of finalizing some of those selections internally. Um, and our team in ASD will be then providing updates on those to our exec staff and so on with that process. Wonderful. Um, really appreciate it. I'd like to learn what those uh, seven identified areas are, um, especially as they relate to seniors. So if there was, you know, if, if there's give, uh, more weight is being given to um, a location and if the location also um, identifies uh, a, a more dense uh, representation of, of uh, seniors in that particular area, I would completely understand. But if it, it didn't, then I, um, I would be concerned with that. But I'm sure that all of that is within some of those seven identified areas. If we can just check um, with each other um, offline, you don't have to give those to me now. Um, Absolutely. We'll be sure to follow up with you in your office on those outcomes. Wonderful. And one of the reasons why I ask that is because, as you've heard me say in this uh, committee and in um, the dais, my district doesn't necessarily get targeted. One um, part of my district is uh, well-resourced, um, shall we say. And uh, there's a segment of my district that is not, but it's not uh, in that portion of it is not very connected to uh, nonprofits and service agencies. And so I want to, you know, just beat the drums and make sure that um, our Welch area and our Meadow Fair area continues to be considered. Um, we have a lot of our elder, uh, older residents there. Um, and there's always a congregate place at the malls, any mall. You will see um, uh, a group of, uh, um, I don't know what we, senior, seniors, um, I'm not sure what the label is nowadays, um, but those of a certain age that don't want to deal with some of the, the heat outside or the cold outside, and it could be anybody of any age, but in particular, maybe some seniors that I've noticed. Um, I, I don't know if we would also consider um, malls and place where where we would find seniors as as part of those factors that um, contribute to some of those uh, grantee selections. Um, all right, so do I have a motion and a second? Move to approve and accept. 
Second. Perfect. Jimenez? Yes. Cohen? Oh, uh, uh, Council Member Cohen left. Okay. Esparza? Yes. Carrasco? Arenas? Uh, yes. And Council Member Carrasco has been um, trying to get back into the system. She's been kicked out a couple of times. Um, I just wanted our public to know that, as well as Council Member Cohen didn't leave. Um, uh, he left because there is a reason, and he had another meeting, another committee um, at four o'clock. Okay, so moving to our last item, and this is Better Housing Initiative Status Report. This is from our housing department. Yay! <laughs> you all finally get to be heard. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I can go ahead and share my screen. Hold on a second. Okay. Just want to make sure. Um, there we go. Okay. All right. All right, well, good late afternoon, committee. Um, my name is Rachel Vanderveen. I'm the deputy director of the housing department. And this afternoon, I am joined by Tasha Matos, our senior development officer, and Bianca Madrid, our communities program administrator. And I just want to say that these two have really taken an idea and have created the Better Housing Initiative program. And so we're just very happy to be here today to provide an update for you. So I wanna start off the presentation with an overview of what the Better Housing Initiative is, the vision and goals for this program. So through partnership and collaboration, the Better Housing Initiative aims to assist management and ownership at problematic multifamily affordable residence developments and enhancing ongoing communication with tenants and improving on-site services. The, uh, the, sites that, the sites that we have selected have been brought to our attention in different ways. So um, there may have been um, code enforcement complaints, tenant complaints, and neighborhood concerns regarding these specific properties. With the intention of influencing systemic approaches to enhance the quality of affordable housing throughout San Jose, the Better Housing Initiative's current focus is to work with large properties with 50 units or more. And this initiative supports efforts to facilitate conversations between property ownership and to build trust and collaborate to build mutual goals and resolutions for problems that come up. The Better Housing Initiative pilot program provides unique and focused opportunity to access current and ongoing needs at specific properties. And I wanted to just update the committee to help you understand that we have selected two properties um, for this initiative for this year, and we have Valley Palms and Foxdale Apartments are the two that are going to we're going to be um, working with in our pilot phase of this program. The Better Housing Initiative oversees program activities centered around building and strengthening partnerships and collaboration with development owners and managers to promote standard practices and procedures to manage their properties responsibly. Partnership and collaboration can open doors to allow communication about problems as they come along so that we can resolve issues quickly. I'm now gonna turn the presentation over to Bianca and she's gonna walk us through the timeline. Thank you, Rachel. Good evening, good, excuse me, good afternoon, uh, everybody. My name is Bianca Madrid. I'm the Community Programs Administrator for this initiative. Um, and I'll go ahead and walk us through as Rachel mentioned. So as you can see here in our timeline, um, in May of 2021, we had a, um, or staff onboarding, which is when I came on board, um, or in the early spring, I came on board with the housing department and we did a soft launch of our program in May. Uh, but I do want to note that, you know, from June to July, it was mostly bridge building with partners and the residential community. 
and also really pushing forward ongoing efforts to establish a presence at the target sites that we are intending to work with, being Foxdale Village Apartments and Valley Palms Apartments. Um, we were able to gain more traction with our collaboration and partnership at these sites, at these target sites, after our meeting in June to you all, uh, when the scope and bounds of our work were more established. Um, so in general, what I'd like to highlight um, about this slide is that some of the aspects of, the pro of our program that we reviewed during the summer months include the following, um, ensuring that our services were not du duplicating other partners' efforts, and also an ongoing effort to find gaps uh, to fill in a partner collaboration and really complement the efforts and uh, expand you know, where we can uh, offer the most value um, with working at these target sites. Also, uh, this time period from, um, in June was the early stage of meeting greets and introductions with many partners as well as tenants so that they can meet um, myself and other staff members from the housing department supporting these efforts and just learn more overall about the Better Housing Initiative program. Uh, we also took this time to review the feasibility for including ARO, ARO units in our program scope and capacity as discussed at our last presentation here to you all. And then we also brought into uh, our purview the discussion of reviving the RLEI program, the Responsible Landlord Engagement Initiative, which was previously uh, housed under Catholic Charities. Um, and that discussion included discussing uh, the community and fiscal impact, the scope of their services, minimum staffing levels, and opportunities for future collaboration with our new initiative. Um, next slide, please. All right. So moving into July, after our program model was approved by our council committee, we went ahead and pivoted into an implementation strategies which included some of the following. Um, as I mentioned earlier, establishing and strengthening partnerships, collaborating and engaging with tenant groups, um, monitoring the Valley Palms TEFRA addendum. This is actually a good opportunity just to provide a quick update about the Valley Palms TEFRA, uh, since that is something that we've been um, actively monitoring and engaging with, with ownership and management. Um, so all terms for the TEFRA uh, addendum have been completed and adhered to apart from a portion of the exterior line item, um, excuse me, exterior lighting, which is a line item in the TEFRA addendum. However, um, San Jose Police Department and other stakeholders have participated in adding input and the owner um, KDF have asked for additional um, input in selecting the ultimate equipment that they're going to be using. So that one, although it's not quite complete, it is in process and the ownership and management are actively um, engaging in efforts and strategies to complete that last portion um, to complete all, all items. Um, another big item in the uh, TEFRA addendum was our role in supporting the transition efforts for a new property management company to take over Valley Palms, which took place on July 1st of this year when the John Stewart Company took over Valley Palms apartments um, for property management. Uh, another item that we were able to uh, mobilize and respond to as a better housing initiative was responding and supporting on site at Foxdale Apartments during and post an emergency water outage that uh, occurred at that property in late July. Uh, our initiative was able to work with property management at Foxdale to discuss changes and improvements in business practices and management pro protocols for emergency planning. Um, I know that my manager, Tasha, will speak more to this during her slides, but I do want to note that it was really uh, a, a testimony to, you know, us being engaged with them prior to this and being ready to assist um, rather quickly when this event took place. Um, and I also like to note that the current management company at Foxdale Valley, uh, excuse me, Village Property Management, VPM, They've also been very cooperative in working with us and changing some of their protocols and modifying management policies as we've engaged in these discussions with them prior to the water outage, but also even more accelerated um, since that event has taken place. Next slide. So moving into August, uh, a lot of our efforts were geared and centered around continued stakeholder engagement and also emergency rental assistance. Uh, we were able to, as our initiative, support the National Night Out site events that took place at Valley Palms and Foxdale. And we we're also able to mobilize our emergency rental assistance resource staff to visit these properties and eventually, um, shortly after National Night Out, offer 
um, a very high level of service by coordinating pop-up um, eviction help centers on site at both of these target properties. So that was definitely um, you know, a testament to our collaboration to work with pro property management and ownership, as well as other city departments like Project Hope um, and county partners like the probation department, um, the neighborhood services unit over at Valley Palms. Uh, our initiative also co-presented at um, a recent Project Hope meeting during the month of August to introduce our program and engage more with tenants. Um, and then we also hosted a community event over at Valley Palms independently, and we brought in our depar housing department's asset management team, as well as our Better Housing Initiative staff, to, uh, with the intention of informing and empowering tenants on affordable housing basics during a rental increase period that took place at Valley Palms in August. Um, and just kind of underscoring that from August to September, our initiative really um, needed to respond to the needs of the community. So we didn't have to, we did have to pivot our support and services to provide more emergency rental assistance to residents um, with a special focus at these target sites, but also uh, working you know, uh, with, within our department to support efforts all around the city. Um, I'll go ahead and jump to the not, my last slide for September of 2021. And I do want to know uh, that our timeline from our original presentation to, uh, to this committee included the development of a tenant and property survey uh, at these locations. And although that's still on the horizon, it's something that we're still very interested in uh, developing and administering. At this time, we've uh, decided to reconsider the timing of developing it and conducting it a little bit further into uh, our time on the property and working with our partners. One of the reasons uh, being that some of our other stakeholder partners have conducted their own community surveys uh, at these properties. So we recognize that there's some level of saturation in terms of community surveying. And also in conjunction with that, many of the residents are really laser focused on obtaining emergency rental assistance. So that's where we're shifting our focus to engage and use our outreach um, efforts around those matters. Uh, but we do plan to revisit a, a more updated timeline on when we could you know, develop and administer this. Um, but in the meantime, we do intend to continue our conversations with ownership and property management in hopes of extracting some of the information we would like to uh, obtain from the survey from them directly. So it could even just shape um, maybe even more streamlined efforts um, with this delay, this temporary delay. Um, so with that, I will pass it over to my manager, Tasha, and she can talk more about um, housing department's expertise and value in our initiative here. Tasha, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, I, to, I see you going. <laughs> I kind of needed that. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Um, housing expertise and value. Better Housing Initiative has a unique understanding and expertise about the elements related to housing. This includes the financial aspects, construction and rehab components, ownership and property management practices. Being focused on a target site, we are positioned to identify gaps and areas of improvement within business practices of property operations, specifically deed restricted properties. By dedicating staff efforts to bring in the community needs to the business partner conversations, we can support improved relationships between property owners and management and community partners. For example, a few months ago, the water main at Foxdale had broken. After vendors repaired, an additional main ruptured the following day, leaving 287 households without water. With better, with better Housing Initiative working behind the scenes with our expertise, we were quickly able to assess and respond and to provide city support to all affected. This allowed us to facilitate accurate and immediate communication with leadership in housing, emergency services, and key stakeholders. Although Foxdale is not a part of our city's portfolio and has no obligation to share or discuss their business practices in detail with us, they have participated in open dialogue regarding their existing procedures and policies with Better Housing Initiative. Requiring ongoing and persistent interaction, VPM, who is the current management company, has been cooperative in changing and modifying some business protocols and updating and improving management policies. They have invited Better Housing Initiative influence and 
support efforts for systemic change within their portfolio in San Jose. Additionally, we have been able to open meaningful dialogue regarding properties needs for rehabilitation, resyndication, refinancing, et cetera. Our expertise knowledge of these specific business practices allows us to engage and facilitate meaningful connections with the owners while our community engagement allows us to continually include and prioritize the tenants' needs. Any single action to assist taken at these properties has the potential to make a huge difference for the quality of life for a very large number of families in San Jose. And I think that's really important for us to remember. Rachel? All right, thank you, Tasha. So um, that basically is our, um, our broad report back from the program. And I wanted to take a moment to respond to some of the questions the last time we met with this committee. Um, and so I wanted to just walk through some of our thoughts and respond to some of the questions that were brought up. So in June, when we, when we met with NSC and we really kind of unveiled the concept for the Better Housing Initiative, there were two questions that came up that we, um, we needed to wrestle with a little bit. So one was, would we be able to provide support to units that are covered by the apartment rent ordinance? And then the second question was, um, is there any way to kind of revitalize the responsible landlord engagement initiative, could that be brought back? So I wanna kind of break that down and um, provide an update to the committee. So first, regarding the apartment rent ordinance units, what we have decided is that the city and the housing department is really uniquely suited to provide support to larger developments and large being 50 units or more. And under the apartment rent ordinance, there are some um, units that are 50 units or more, but not very many, honestly. The majority of, of um, buildings that are covered by the apartment rent ordinance are more like 20 units or less, but there are several fourplexes, sixplexes, tenplexes. That's really the largest number of, of structures. And so what we feel is that providing support to um, smaller buildings like that would actually be better suited for a nonprofit agency rather having than um, the expertise that the city is able to bring to the larger. And we've also found that providing support to the larger, the 50 units or more is difficult for non the nonprofit agencies, whereas that's where we can actually come in and really have more of an impact. So um, what we would like to report back to the committee today is that we feel that there's a distinction and that we, we need to stay focused on the larger developments. And we do feel that a nonprofit would really be the best way to approach some of the smaller buildings in the city. Now, second, the question was, what about the Responsible Landlord Initiative, our LEI? What's happening with it? What's going on? And so what we were able to do after the last meeting is we were able to sit down and meet with Catholic Charities and really um, dig into that question. And so what we learned is that um, Catholic Charities is very willing to relaunch the RLEI program, but they need funding. And so they were able to put together a budget for us. And it'll basically what they're um, projecting is it would be about $390,000 a year to run the RLEI program. So they are seeking that funding now. And what we will like to do as the housing department is to actually bring that forward in our upcoming budget process to say, if we had additional funding, then we could work with Catholic Charities to go ahead and relaunch the RLEI program. And then finally, what I wanted to also just talk about is that we do feel that there could be synergy between both RLEI and the Better Housing Initiative, that we can have staff working on each side and like coordinating and trying to work together so that as there may be expertise that the city staff can bring to the RLEI staff, um, we can do that. And honestly, as our LEI staff, who can sometimes just be more connected to the grassroots, um, they can also provide us 
information and just better better knowledge about how to approach um, the work that we're doing as well. So we really feel that the two can work together, but have different focuses um, divided by property size and kind of the nature of those different properties. So finally, I just wanted to provide a little bit of a timeline for what's coming, what you can expect from our initiative. So we are returning back to this committee again in February with a report on um, progress for the Better Housing Initiative. And um, we will also, as I mentioned, we will also be including a conversation about our LEI in our annual budget process, which will also happen in the spring. With that, we are concluding our report and we are available for any questions you might have. Thank you. Um, we're gonna move into public comment and Michael, I think we have one person. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Woodman C. Thank you. Um, so basically, uh, one of the issues I'd like to know how to contact this uh, project of, on housing because I have a girlfriend who lives in at Cinnabar Commons and there's been a lot of problems there and so you know really outreaching to how we get support um, for improving our, our low income and very low income housing would be very helpful and I don't think you're doing a very good job at that because we haven't you know she's she's been suffering through a lot of problems at the Cinnabar Commons and so it'd be good if we had more outreach about that. And so, you know, the thing is, you know, you know, you know, the thing is I can call the housing department and maybe I'll reach somebody and maybe they'll, they'll contact me back, you know, but I doubt it, you know, and my husband was just telling me today, you know, about the problems on our road, you know, when he was riding his bicycle, who do I call? Who do we, how do you call? Who do you call? Ghostbusters. Nobody's there. This is the problem. And, and, you know, we're not, we're not, act, we're not able to do things. And even if I go to 311, they're not going to, you know, this is beyond their scope to even, that's what I'll get the comment back. So we really need to be able to reach you and you call. And Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Um, this is like really uh, imaginative good work. And it's like really needed from, you know, uh, Council Person Mahan, you know, laid down the list of uh, experimental housing ideas. You know, he also asked and offered the ideas of what can be, uh, are there good practices we can do at this time? This is one of them. Boy, thank you for this. Um, I'm interested how this idea can help facilitate dialogue uh, for, uh, for uh, local government sponsored homeless encampment issues. Can that be possible? Can this help facilitate dialogue with Vista Montana issues? And, and um, what is it, uh, safe parking sites. Um, this is a really interesting program idea. Um, you're involving nonprofits. Um, good luck in, in, in the efforts uh, you can do with this. Anything to be imaginative and creative, I hope this can help this time uh, what I've been offering and good luck to yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Taking it back to the committee. Um, Council member Sparza. Thank you. Um, I'll just, so I first, I wanted to thank you for coming to Valley Palms. Um, and I think the fact that Valley Palms and Foxdale are both, um, county supported sites are really important. So there's really good support for the community and working with the neighborhood services unit from the probation department, um, the, the tenants themselves, um, other groups that are coming in, the uh, first five um, that are in there. And so I, I, I think um, that focus is great and, and have appreciated the housing department coming out. I did, um, also, can you walk me through again on the RLEI um, portion, the differentiation, like what is that threshold between small, because I heard you say small. Could you explain that a little bit more, please? 
Yeah, absolutely, council member. So what we have done is, um, again, just thoughtfully considered the questions from the last time. And so what we're defining as small and large is 50 units or more. So 50 units or more would be something that the city would be involved in. And something that is, you know, um, less than 50 would be something that would be more appropriate for, or just a better match for what um, our LEI can bring to the table. So that's the threshold we've determined is 50 units. And how might the city do, for example, um, you know, I can think of many smaller apartment buildings um, that, that are having some issues, right? And um, so we're hoping that the nonprofit can support them. How is the city gonna oversee that? Because I can imagine that some of them might ratchet up um, and some of them, might be owned by the same, uh, same uh, have the same landlord, or there might be some, uh, some other issues in a geographic location, right? Right, so we have um, coordinated really closely with our LEI team. So um, in the past, when we were meeting and they were operating, they had uh, monthly meetings that our the housing staff attended every month. And um, we understood they, they're, they had a pretty um, solid agenda of, you know, we're working at this property and this, you know, they were very clear. And so what we did is um, met with them just to understand what their, you know, what their target um, or how they were prioritizing their properties. And um, we provided any support that we could on that. And it just helped us coordinate as well. Like you said, if there were patterns or um, different things that came up, then we were able to coordinate with whatever program within the city we were able to connect them with to make sure um, there was coordinated services. So I guess what I'm, I'm interested in is if, uh, because I had had some experiences when I first got to the council and they weren't good, just to be honest. Um, the tenants weren't getting a lot of connected support. Mm -hmm. It was like one-off here's a letter, but in spite of that, there were patterns emerging mm -hmm. and there was a lot of frustration, um, you know, um, amongst everybody's parts about, hey, it's time that we have to bring, as a city, we have to sort of wrap our arms around this neighborhood a little bit more, mm -hmm. um, that it's not, the regular tools are not going to work. And that's really what I'm getting at with the question. And so what would that look like? Because because usually, you know, that's incumbent on a council member or somebody else, but I'm trying to see what like the systemic approach would be. Um, I would just say that um, if it is something that is going to need to be coordinated at a higher level, I think that even the housing department would have to coordinate with the city manager's office. And, you know, we would be, you know, I can pick on Angel. We'd be calling Angel, saying, Angel, you know what? We actually need to kind of pull together a broader effort here um, in order to address the complexity of the issues that this neighborhood is facing. And so what I think is a, a, good, a good opportunity is to have the housing department, again, connected with the... Um, with the outside program so we can spot those things and we know how to escalate them and bring them forward and then and then the city will need to prioritize right and we need to we'll make our decisions too about like how can we how can we look at resources and determine how we want to allocate them yeah i i think and i'll pick oh angel did you want to speak <laughs> yeah yeah i was just going to kind of chime in here because i first of all i think it's a very timely question because i really think the issues that are experienced by a lot of these different um uh tenants and and community members here um r really intersect with our community and economic recovery efforts right mm -hmm. and so I, I really think we need to kind of erase the dotted line and make a more solid line and so so one of the takeaways from this meeting here is we'll continue to uh expand on number one you know, operationalizing the RLEI, and I, I really like the progress that has been made around, you know, getting this relaunched and activated because that's definitely a service that needs to continue, especially now more than ever. So, uh, you know, kudos to the housing department for really, you know, continuing that and we'll accelerate that. And then secondly, let's expand this conversation to link it with our broader community and economic recovery and ARP funds, because there's definitely an intersect there. 
uh, that will connect. So um, we'll put that on our follow-up list. Thank you, and I appreciate that because I think all too often it it falls onto the caseworker or it falls onto the housing department to figure it out all by themselves. And the, the fact is something may come through the RLEI process and then we'll start to see certain patterns emerge mm -hmm. and then um, it, it honestly it becomes bigger than just the housing department. We as a city need to kind of come together a little bit more and make those assessments and bring those resources. And, and the vast majority will be able to be taken care of, but um, sometimes on the big ones, on the patterns, it goes on a little too long before the city starts to back up housing department or the city starts to back up the nonprofit. So that's great to hear. Um, and that's it for me, Chair, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Cohen. Yeah, thank you um, for that report. And thank you for following up on some of the questions that I was asking last time about RLEI. Um, and I really appreciate also, um, Angel, your, your thoughtful comments about operationalizing that program a little bit more and, and providing a more systemic approach. You know, I know that from some cases that we've already been dealing with in District 4, um, there, there's, a, there's a need for this kind of a service, so starting with you know, the RLEI program, which would be an outside provider. Many of our neighborhoods relied on them and are missing that opportunity to continue to have that, that service. But even when we, we get to more serious cases which go beyond what they can do, um, there are a lot of cross-functional things that have to happen in the city. Right? And we, we've had to engage the city attorney's office, the city manager's office, and various offices to get involved in these cases. And so you know, maybe figuring out how to provide a, a roadmap for how to deal with some of these cases so that in the future it's not you know, figuring it out at a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I was at the Cal Cities, League of Cities uh, conference a couple weeks ago and went to a workshop that uh, some cities put on about programs they've actually put in place in their city to deal with this kind of issue. They put Some cities have actually hired staff and built a department around this through the city attorney's office, actually. And it, was, it was mainly because these are a lot of legal issues. How do, you, how do you deal with dilapidated properties? How do you deal with properties that are abandoned um, in neighborhoods, you know, some cities like Vallejo have, have used that department to buy and, and, and uh, um, repair and then sell properties in order to, to upgrade areas that need upgrading. Or, and so having that department in the city was very useful to that, just to the city. And obviously we might handle it differently, but we should know what that process is and where people need to go to get that help when these cases come up. Um, and we just dealt with a significant case in our district the last few months, actually we're still dealing with it. But um, having that the RLI program as a starting point, I think will be very helpful, but we shouldn't consider it uh, that that's gonna be the finishing point in a, lot of, in a lot of these cases. But anyway, I appreciate that. I look forward to that discussion coming up in the spring and, and supporting providing some funding through the budget to, to revitalize that program for our community. Council Member Cohen, would you like to honor us with a motion? I'll so move that we uh, accept the report. Second. Wonderful. Ruth. Jimenez? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Carrasco? Aye. Arenas? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Chair, you're muted. <laughs> oh my gosh. We, all right. We are at the end of this meeting and thank you so much for your patience and your cooperation. We've had uh, six items on this agenda that were quite meaty. All right, we are moving on to open forum. Tessa Woodman, see. Thank you so much, yes. Well, you know, this is parks, recreation, and neighborhood services. And what's very disturbing is that our commercial properties are not putting into our parkland, um, our in lieu fees, the parkland fees. That is terrible. And that's why we, you know, everybody says that we don't, we don't have land. But I've been saying, hey, there's land in my neighborhood, you know, that isn't being built yet. And, you know, that it hasn't been built. It has 615 Stockton Avenue. And I wanted this, you know, the city to buy it. And the thing is, is that, you know, we're not creating um, enough open spaces. You know, it's very sad to hear 
my the, the, the council members say she's got to go to Willow Glen to, to find an open space, you know, or a nice tree vined area. And this needs to be our emphasis. We need to refocus and reclaim land, Mother Earth. And we need to really be putting our money where our mouth is and start buying lands in all our neighborhoods to be growing food locally and, and then, you know, teaching all of us so that all of us grow food in all of our, any place we can, in our, in our homes, outside our homes, or on top of our roofs. Blair Beekman. Hi, thank you, Blair Beekman here. There's gonna be a really important uh, report this next summer about the future of the commission process. Look for it. And I hope uh, people of local neighborhoods um, are interested in uh, small local government sponsored encampment ideas for homeless. Uh, good luck in these efforts. Uh, it is being reported, Southwest, Southwest Airlines offered a serious walkout last weekend. They're not against the current vaccine mandate of the airlines. They simply wanted a better negotiation process first. This is all I've been asking for at public comment time in the past few weeks. I think in San Jose, we're all seeing a seam how to create a continued open, honest, good dialogue for all sides about the science and technology of the vaccine process and how we can all better understand the spread of COVID-19 this fall. Open public policies with technology can very much help facilitate this needed good dialogue. San Jose, please respect when city government workers have honest fears and do not want to take the current available vaccines. So they think we're all learning there can be interesting options and in developing for all sides and that can very much respect community health and safety concerns this fall and winter. I've seen a public thank comment, you. sir, Pam. Thank you, Mr. Beekman, and thank you, um, Mike. This concludes our Neighborhood Services and Education Committee. Have a wonderful rest of the day, everyone.